and they were like, how do I get my kids to eat vegetables? And you're just like, uh, maybe you don't need to get them to eat vegetables. <laughs> no, that's a true story. I was at the airport, you know, and I kind of carry my sport around with me. And the guy in front of me had two young boys and they were probably, I don't know, six and eight years old. And uh, he turned around to me and he goes, see, boys, if you want to get big and strong, you got to eat your vegetables. And he mm. was he, he's like, right. And he looks at me and he's nodding his head. And I looked at him and I go, seriously, are you you're asking me for real? He goes, yeah. Mm. And I said, boys, if you want to get big, you need to eat a lot of red meat, whole eggs, and milk. And he looked at me in shock. And I said, I shrugged my shoulders. I said, you asked, man. I trained some of the greatest athletes in the world. I said, you're not going to get big on vegetables. <laughs> so he's, and that's what I believe, whole, you know, through and through. And I've done many videos on it. And I'm now writing a book, actually. My next book is Vertical Kids. And I talk about the importance of these these farm foods for, um, for these kids to achieve their genetic potential. And I'm uh, absolutely convinced that protein leads the way. And as a matter of fact, Dr. Jose Antonio from the International Society of Sports Nutrition did a presentation at the National Strength and Conditioning Association's conference in DC two years ago. And he talked about uh, uh, nutrient, uh, talked about diets for kids. And he, he said one thing, he said, get them a gram of protein per pound of body weight from a variety of sources. That was it. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that in its entirety. And I think that's where we fall short. I think that's where adults fall short too. Mostly mm -hmm. women. They get up in the morning and they'll have one egg. Well, that's six grams of protein. You know, in general, I think they should take in about 130 a day. How far are we now? They're only going to get in three meals, four at the most. How close are they to 130 grams of protein eating one egg for breakfast with a piece of toast and a cup or, of coffee? Yeah. Or oatmeal. They yeah, they'll think... Grams. Exactly. Or juice. It's like, oh, we got to drink juices uh, or, you know, like smoothies or we got to get yeah. oatmeal yeah. with all the things like this is no protein. These two have no protein in them. Eat human. Les humains à leur meilleur. Eat Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Peak Human. My name is Brian Sanders. I'm the creator of the Food Lies film, which is being edited daily. We got some good things going on. We got a new animator. Really excited about this. We're going to make the best motion graphics, the best visuals. We have a custom soundtrack being made, a great composer. This is going to be awesome. Taking a while though, but it's well worth the wait. In the meantime, you can go back to episode one of this podcast. Every week I get stories from people telling me how great it is to go back, listen to them all, change their life. It's a free audio course, the free curriculum on health. So start back at episode one. You can also join the newsletter at sapien.org. It's a great way to stay in touch about things. We send out great content each week now. So far it's been every two weeks, but we're gonna start ramping it up because social media is a mess. I don't trust it. I don't know if everyone's seeing all my posts anyway. The algorithms make it so not everyone gets to see your posts. So why chance it? Why not just get the real thing from the newsletter, uncensored, unblocked. We sent out some articles, some links we find around the internet. We sent out specials for nose to tail, get some deals on some meat, some regenerative meat, and updates on the film and other things. So newsletter, saping.org. Today, I'm talking to Stan Efferding, who is the man. This is not an episode for meatheads. This is not some sort of bodybuilding episode. Stan is one of the foremost experts on dieting. He's gained and lost over a thousand pounds. He professionally diets and gets paid good money to the top professionals in the world to help them with their diet, their nutrition plan, how to lose weight, how to gain weight. He's seen it all. And guess what? He's super aligned with the Sapien diet and the Sapien framework. I love talking to him. One of my favorite episodes. I don't say that often, but he just knows his stuff. I also will say I like it because he agrees with me. <laughs> Definitely why it's one of my favorites. He is on point. He's been a friend virtually for a couple years. I love everything he does. He's got a really good mindset. He's got a really good take on these things. It's balanced. He looks at both sides, just like I like to do. So enjoy this one. I also like him because he's a fan of the biltong. <laughs> at the end, he talks about how great it is and how fast his family ate it and how much he likes it. So that's awesome. You can get the biltong at notesatail.org. We have all the other meats there. You get fresh boxes of meats sent out to you to your door. You can get the biltong if you want some meat on the go. We have the seasonings. 
which I can't stop using. I'm making some bone broth right now. I made some stew meat with the primal seasoning. Always good on any meat. Of course, the body care. We got the soap back in stock, so check that out. We finally got some new stuff in stock. It takes a while to cure. This is all handmade stuff. Got a lot of stuff on nose and tail. It's turning into a real one-stop shop for all things meat, all things sustainable, regenerative, all the great practices, all from Texas, right here in the U.S., nosetail.org, saping.org for everything else. The program, the tribe. We're having a tribe meeting tomorrow, actually. If you join now, you can join Dr. Gary and I tomorrow, noon, PST, 2 p.m. Central. We are going to do a live Zoom call with the tribe. You can join that at saping.org. And that's about it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for sharing with a friend. Thanks for going back to episode one, checking out all the great episodes, all the great people. People keep asking me, oh, you you should have Mark Sisson on. Yeah, I had Mark Sisson. You just got to go back and listen to them. I have tons of great people on if you go back. So another great one with Stan Efferding. All right, Stan, how's it going today? How are you doing? Good, brother. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah, we've been talking for years i guess just here and there finally time to yeah. do a pod i watch all your episodes so you you're a great interviewer and i love your guests i don't know how you get all these great guests on but uh, i'm a mm. an, uh, i love to watch podcasts sometimes i wake up at three o'clock in the morning can't get back to bed and you're on the short list of uh, podcasts that i pull up to help put me to sleep not that it's uh, <laughs> sleepy but then i wake up in the morning and i have to listen to it again because it's always so interesting and your guests are so good Wow. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I do get some great guests. I like Stan Efferding, you know? No, we, uh, it's been great making the film and I get to, you know, connect with all these great people while I shoot the film and get them on the show. So, yeah, we've been um, talking for a while. I guess we started talking probably for the Game Changers Debunked, which is yeah. great. You submitted a video, just really solid, sensible. You did a little walk and talk and we included it in the Game Changers Debunked film yeah yeah that's you know that's kind of my message is uh really what you can comply with is kind of the foundation i originally started with uh some rhinos rants many years ago four or five years ago i started releasing rants and you know the, the fundamental message of that was you know all diets work when they're strictly adhered to and the best ones are uh, the one that you can follow because 95 percent of weight loss uh, or health outcomes are realized simply from weight loss itself, irrespective of diet. So my biggest challenge from training people over the course of 30 years is just finding something for them that they can make a lifestyle that, uh, and be consistent with, simple, sensible, and sustainable. And so I mentioned the same thing about vegan diets. I'm agnostic, to be honest with you. If I, if I thought people could stick with it, uh, it just has a low compliance rate. And uh, I just don't see a lot of great athletes performing well on it. And uh, to me, I'd eat a brick if a brick would make me perform better. So vegan would be a step up from that. <laughs> <laughs> well, th- this is a great topic because you kind of mentioned a lot of nuances that people have been on both sides of. And I've had guests like Lane Norton say, hey, it's just about calories. And then I'll push back with some more. And and there's so much nuance. So we can dive into that because yeah. I do agree with you. So, so much is about <clears throat> what you can apply and, and the weight loss itself. But I would... I would want to get into nutrient density and bioavailability, which is part of my problem with the vegan diet. So maybe you can comment on that. Oh, of course. Now, what I like to say is that that calories, a calorie equation, you know, the the energy balance equation, is of primary importance at the end of the day, regardless of which uh, diet you choose. Uh, I've said there's many paths to the same destination, and uh, you know, adhering to that path will ultimately determine whether or not an individual is successful. Having said that, adherence uh, depends on the things you just mentioned. It depends on nutrient density and bioavailability uh, for a number of reasons. I think the reason that people go off of diets, and this has been studied very well by the Weight Control Registry, is they either get hungry or they get tired. If you didn't get hungry and you didn't get tired, uh, other than, than maybe psychological uh, issues, maybe uh, stress or you know, boredom eating or uh, you know, traumatic circumstances, um, if you didn't get tired and you didn't get hungry, you could adhere to the diet. And so now we're down to strategies. And you, you hit the nail on the head. 
Uh, we don't have a lot of tools in this toolbox, unfortunately. We have a, you know, the most of us realize we have a very high failure rate, a very high recidivism for weight regain. Uh, I think even Lane himself said within three years, over 90% of people tend to regain uh, the majority, if not more weight than they originally uh, had lost. So uh, that's when strategies come in. That's when um, protein leveraging, using uh, you know, higher protein diets, whole food diets for the satiety impact and for the thermic effect of food becomes kind of one of the primary drivers of success, I believe. If I'm going to put things in order, I'm going to start with protein. Uh, and then I'm going to move to uh, the nutrient density of, of those foods. Like you said, highly bioavailable, so you have adequate energy. The absorbability of things like heme iron or, uh, you know, the vitamin A from retinol as opposed to carotenoids. Uh, so you do have to have a pretty broad and sufficient micronutrient base to prevent yourself from uh, getting tired while on a calorie deficit and losing weight. And then there's only a couple other strategies, really. One is going to be, again, high satiety foods, and there's an index for that. Uh, boiled potatoes and oranges seem to be at the highest end of the satiety index, aside from high protein sources, of course, which we just covered. And then fiber is really uh, the next uh, high satiety food that you can put in. And I think we both discussed over the years that there are some challenges with how much fiber and what type of fiber in terms of uh, being able to comply with the diet and, and digestive distress, certainly for people with IBS or extreme or excessive gas and bloating, uh, or even anti-nutrients in some cases, depending on how those fiber sources are prepared and what quantity you consume them in. So. Yeah, I, I like to cover all of that stuff. Um, I always kick off with calories are king uh, and compliance is the science. But then, you know, that I, I say those things are truthful, not useful. Mm. Things like move more, eat less. Yeah, that's truthful. There's no question about it. But it's not useful. And so that's when uh, I go into the discussion that we just had and the things I just covered. Uh, as to what type of diet works best for the individual. And here's the strategies that may help. Cool. You're speaking my language. And <clears throat> I can tell, yeah, you're a fan of like the Ted Namens and all, all the great people that we've had on over the years. And this is what I was thinking about today, actually. The useful, truthful, but not useful. I was just thinking some guy, you know, I always get the people, in the cal it's just about calories, it's just, about, just about cut your calories. And I say, yes, of course, of course, of course, of course. But how much is it worth if you paid to have a consult with you, Stan, and, and you just told them your intervention was to eat less calories? That's worth two cents. But if you tell them how to achieve the sustainable calorie loss, that could be worth thousands of dollars to someone. Yes. And, you know, you hit the nail on the head. And here's where I start to go sideways with people who like to criticize my diet, the vertical diet. Uh, <clears throat> I create a spreadsheet of sorts uh, that, that starts with the things we just discussed. And then way down at the bottom of the list, I need to be specific because someone just hired me to tell them what to eat. And I could tell them, like you said, well, eat less, move more. Uh, they're going to be very uh, very frustrated, right? <laughs> because they're not diet people. You and I, we live this. This is our life, you know, and we read all the stuff and we watch all the videos and we've applied this ourselves, worked with clients. Uh, our customers do not. And they come to us to give them the answers. And, and what I've found is, is that when, I, and when I'm general with them, they're frustrated. Stan, just tell me exactly what to eat. And so I do that. <clears throat> and I do that you know, kind of based on a questionnaire where I try and find out what their specific preferences are and what their lifestyle is and what their, uh, you know, schedule is, et cetera, and the kinds of foods they like and don't like. And I cater that to them, of course. It's hard to do in a book. Um, you know, I, I have to talk more in generalities. Yes. <laughs> I got a vertical diet right here. Thank we'll you. Talk about that in a second, but yeah, keep going. You can't, yeah, you got to, yeah, got to customize it for sure. Yeah, I, I, you know, they demand that of me. Tell me exactly what to eat. I've even had customers, uh, you know, I've been, I've had the vertical diet ebook out for nearly five years now. And it started out as a version 1.0 and then 2.0 and then 3.0. As time progressed and more people asked me more questions, I've responded to over 
100,000 DMs in the last five years. And I've taken that information, those questions, and I've uh, you know, consolidated that down and I've uh, expanded on the book over, over the years to give people uh, the answers to the questions that I most commonly get. And uh, what I found is, is that they want specifics. They want a grocery shopping list and a menu plan. And so I give that to them. And that doesn't mean that's all they can eat. That just means that this is what I think are the most important things. And again, it's going to have calories as, as kind of the leading uh, priority. And then after that, your macros, protein being the key component of that. And I do talk about you know, carbs and fats being kind of equivalent. Uh, you can move them around where you want based on personal preference and how your satiety uh, and your energy levels are impacted by different percentages. Uh, and then, of course, micronutrients are in there. But I have to give them a very specific diet plan uh, and then talk them through, uh, you know, important things like satiety and, and, uh, and energy. Uh, or, you know, they're, they're going to seek that information from someone else, of course. That's what they demand of me. So I've done that and I get some, sometimes I get some feedback from the academic community that uh, it's too restrictive. Um, well. It, as compared to what is often my question, because I come from the bodybuilding figure physique bikini industry, mm -hmm. uh, and those are some of the most restrictive diets on the planet. I've been training those athletes since the late, late 80s. Over 30 years, I've worked with competitive uh, physique, um, you know, bodybuilding figure physique people, kind of professional dieters, if you would. And that's what I was for 30 years. I competed in bodybuilding and powerlifting at a professional level. And so I've probably gained and lost well over a thousand pounds throughout mm. my career and learned a lot of lessons along the way on how to do it, quote unquote, correctly, how to not suffer from a lot of the metabolic issues from gaining weight and how to not, uh, uh, how to minimize muscle loss and <clears throat> hunger uh, and performance declines when losing weight and getting down to 4% body fat. So I have a lot of experience in that regard. And uh, I've noticed that those diets that are typically given to uh, the, the figure industry or fitness industry were very restricted. Egg whites, tilapia, broccoli it was very common. Mm -hmm. And that was fine when it was confined to that industry, right? Because they had a specific goal and it wasn't going to be a, a long-term thing and they were just going to get in shape and get on stage and then eat more variety of foods and more quantity of foods so they could uh, obviously uh, rebound or recover from their amenorrhea and uh, their, their anemia and their depression and, and their uh, hair loss, you know, thyroid hair loss, loss and all yeah. that stuff. Sure. Yeah. The problem is, as has happened in the last 10 years and probably more specifically the last five to seven years with the advent of social media, the general population, the soccer moms in particular, started copying the diets that these physique figure bikini women were using and suffering from all of the downsides, thinking this was a, a permanent solution for them uh, and ending up at the doctor's office getting, you know, shots for vitamin D and iron and B12 and uh, in some cases antidepressants because of all of the side effects that resulted. So I think my diet's much more inclusive. Um, than what historically has been out there, but it is very specific because that's what my customers demand of me. I love that. Well, there's so many things we can dive into. So you've worked with so many people. I wanted to talk to you because not that everyone's, you know, into this bodybuilding and physique stuff, but because you have so much experience with your clients and with yourself, and I really like your approach of it is this really balanced approach, even though balance is such a loaded term because I hate, oh, let's eat a balanced diet. But you are kind of bridging the gap between the Lane Nortons of the world that like, you know, really annoy a lot of people. And then the people that get too dogmatic and just say, this is the only way to do it. You have to find somewhere in between that. And that's kind of what you've done. Yeah. Even when I'm talking about the low FODMAP diet, which seems to be associated with me because I select a lot of foods from that, uh, from that, uh, <laughs> that plan. And that's Monash's uh, low FODMAP, fermentable oligo dye, monosaccharides, and polyols. Those are foods that uh, uh, are difficult for people with IBS uh, or some, uh, you know, degree of uh, maybe some significant degree of gas and bloating from eating foods that cause a lot of gas. Uh, foods that 
aren't easily digested in the small intestine and end up in the large intestine being fermented by bacteria and creating a lot of methane. Uh, so I use a lot of those foods and I discuss the uh, digestive distress that can occur in, in some people. What I found in my industry is a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, as a, I lead with those so that people don't have significant gas and bloating uh, and aren't running to the bathroom all the time. <clears throat> but I'm very quick to uh, qualify that by saying, uh, not only is that the majority of my clientele, and I serve a, have historically served a specific clientele, uh, competitive athletes either losing weight or gaining weight. And those foods have wreaked havoc on their digestion. And so I, I caution the use of them, but I always say this, it's individualistic, not everybody suffers from these problems. It's dose dependent, and that's, that's obvious. You know, the quantity of, of what you consume of those can matter. Uh, how they're prepared matters, and that's you know whether or not you uh, correctly cook the beans or the, the broccoli to, to get rid of or minimize the, the lectins or the anti-nutrients that are easier to digest. And it can be cumulative in nature. You might be able to handle a cup of oatmeal on Monday, but by Wednesday when you eat that same cup, now all of a sudden you're having pretty severe gastric distress uh, and you wouldn't think that it was due to the oatmeal because you had it Monday and Tuesday and you were fine unless you're aware that they're cumulative in nature. Mm -hmm. And the same thing could be true with sugar alcohols, uh, sorbitol, mannitol, xylitol. Uh, those commonly cause diarrhea and uh, there's usually a threshold. Um, maybe we just call it a bucket. You can have so many sugar alcohols for breakfast and lunch, but by the time you get to dinner, if you consume more, uh, you're going to spill over and then have those problems. I, I see this commonly with people who eat low sugar foods, uh, ice creams like Halo Top or a lot of those uh, peanut butter balls and protein powders and, and bars at, uh, at uh, expos. Uh, once you reach a certain threshold, that's why those lines are long at the bathrooms at those shows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. So you're covering a lot. So I like the I like to look at the anti nutrients and yes, low FODMAP. And I choose very carefully in the foods I recommend as well. And we're we're pretty on the same page here. But yeah, maybe you could go into yeah, like how you, what is the vertical diet and how you developed it and what specifically type of foods are included because yeah, we need to be specific specific here. Yeah, we do. Uh, now the vertical diet is really more than just a diet. It includes everything that I want my clients to do, because uh, as you know, your food's not going to fix other poor lifestyle <clears throat> behaviors. So over the years, it's kind of the culmination of everything I've learned since college, coaching, competing, uh, you know, collaborating with other athletes and coaches. Uh, <clears throat> and even more recently, in the last couple of years, working closely with uh, my co-author, Dr. Damon McCune, who's a registered dietitian and a PhD who was uh, director of the dietetic department at UNLV. So I, I took all of this information that I had acquired over the years, I bumped it up against uh, academia, and we spent hundreds of hours going through it and providing, you know, over 500 references to peer reviewed published research. Um, <clears throat> but it's very comprehensive. I, over the years, when I'm dealing with clients, I, I got tired of repeating myself over and over and over again. And I found there was a foundation of lifestyle behaviors, including the nutrition, uh, that I wanted all of them to do uh, with minor variations depending upon, again, their personal circumstance. And so it included sleep, hydration, nutrition, digestion, hormone optimization, uh, you know, a host of, of uh, you know, blood testing where necessary uh, to help them manage kind of 300 stress management and kind of help them to, to get the best effect out of their diet. And so that's what the book covers, as you notice there in the um, uh, in the table of contents, we, we give them a, a pathway to optimize their health or performance, uh, but it, it has to be multifactorial. You can't sleep four hours a night and expect your diet to fix that. And we talk about things like digestive distress, IBS, we talk about things like GERD, you know, gas, gas, astric, uh, gastric reflux disease, uh, kind, the kinds of things that are commonly experienced by a lot of people. So <clears throat> once we get them to, to uh, and also exercise. And once we get them to sleep a little better, move a little more, uh, pay attention to uh, their stress and their, their diet, we, then we get kind of specific into the kinds of foods 
that give them the biggest bang for their buck. And we kind of covered the high satiety foods. We, we lead with protein leveraging, probably 25 to 30% of the diet is going to start with protein from a variety of sources. And I tend to, to focus on animal-based sources because they are more highly bioavailable and do have uh, more nutrient density uh, with a lower calorie uh, per protein gram. Uh, try and get you know, 40 grams of protein from beans and you're going to eat 600 calories. Get 40 grams of protein from steak and you're going to eat uh, you know, 230 calories. So uh, I do focus on the calorie cost per gram of protein. And I like to get uh, that from a variety of sources. Now, historically, uh, in the physique industry again, uh, we would uh, eliminate red meat and we would eliminate whole eggs. And to keep going down that trail, we would eliminate yogurt or, or dairy and we would eliminate uh, fruit and we would eliminate salt. Mm -hmm. And all of those things are priorities for me in the diet. That's the foundation. That's how you. Yes. It's, speaking on foundation, that's kind of how the diet is built. You can't put a two bedroom house or a three bedroom house on a two bedroom foundation. So I start with the foods that build a solid foundation, all the, the macronutrients and micronutrients and protein that's necessary. So now you can put whatever you want on that foundation, whether it's a 400 plus pound Hofthor Bjornsson, or it's a football player training twice a day, or it's a soccer mom who's got to get up early, get her kids to school. She's got to work all day, pick them up, take them to whatever events they have. And she's burning the candle at both ends. Uh, she needs just as much of those nutrient dense, um, highly bioavailable, micronutrient dense, easy to digest foods as my top athletes. And that includes a, a 97 pound uh, um, ballerina for the Sacramento Ballet Company. So mm -hmm. I've worked with, with people on, on both ends of the spectrum and, uh, you know, the, the average population, the soccer moms and dad bods, who I consider to have an athlete inside. They, these people work hard, have high stress, uh, lots of responsibilities, and they need fuel just as well as an athlete. And so uh, I start with that foundation of, 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 uh, of a variety of those high quality proteins. I choose steak over chicken. Uh, not that you can't eat chicken. They're both great protein sources. But again, uh, getting the best return on your investment, the best bang for your buck, the most nutrients per forkful, uh, steak is superior. It's, it's, I think, three times higher in zinc and six times higher in iron and, and nine times higher in B12. Uh, it's got creatine, carnitine. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a lot more nutrient dense than chicken. Plus, I found that it's preferable. People enjoy it. And, and so now we're back to sustainability. It's part of a lifestyle that they, they don't want to feel as though they have to exclude it, but they've been told they need to for any variety of, of reasons that just don't pan out. Uh, same with the whole egg. <clears throat> I, I saw this specifically in the figure and fitness and physique industry where people would eat tons and tons of egg whites with no egg yolk. Well, the avidin in the egg white would rob biotin from their body. That biotin's in the egg yolk. And that started to affect the quality of their hair and their skin and nails. That's what biotin's for. So we saw that very commonly in the industry. So I keep an egg yolk in. You could do half and half if you want to meet your protein content and keep your uh, calories and fats down if that's your, your goal. And again, uh, your fat and carb percentages are, are your personal preference. But so those things were important. And then calcium from yogurt. So not everybody can tolerate milk, particularly as you age and your, your lactase enzyme seems to uh, decline. And, uh, but a good Greek yogurt is, is, is very well absorbed by the, uh, a large percentage of the population. I think uh, one of your guests uh, up in Canada, uh, a PhD up there, his name escapes me, said some, somewhere north of 90% of his uh, clientele uh, was able to, to consume a Greek yogurt, and it's dose dependent, maybe a few ounces here, a few ounces there. But the, the purpose of that is it's, it's seen to be cardioprotective. We get a lot of good protein out of it. We also get a very highly bioavailable uh, calcium source out of it. And calcium is not just important for bones. It's important for nerve signaling, and it's important for muscle contraction, which is, you know, obviously bodes well for a lot of my clients who are, who are you know, active in anaerobic activities and sports. So that is my foundation, along with uh, obviously some fruits, 
Um, some low gas vegetables is where I like seafood? to start. Seafood, I think you forgot for the protein side. Did oh you... yeah, the salmon at least twice a week. I know uh, a lot of people talk about um, grass finished beef versus conventional, uh, and that's a whole other conversation. And one of the things that they'll mention is is that it's the grass fed beef is higher in omega threes, but the absolute amount is so low it really doesn't provide you uh, anywhere near. Uh, the amount of omega threes that you need. Uh, salmon has 200 times the amount of omega threes as a grass finished beef. So, yes, I throw in salmon twice a week, uh, mainly for the omega threes, uh, and you could certainly consume it more. I'm, you know, kind of cautious about mercury from some of those uh, <clears throat> larger fish, but you could certainly use uh, sardines and, and the like. Uh, so that's that's in there. That's a pretty broad base of protein sources. And again, you can throw chicken in if you want, some tuna in if you want. It's personal preference. You, you've got a lot of options to get your protein. Um, but don't exclude the things that I just mentioned, which are commonly excluded by the average guru or fitness nutritionist that you might, that you know, even the average population is now coming across at their local gym. Those foods are the foundation. That's the base. We build on that from there and you can achieve just as much weight loss with a lot less, uh, I think, exposure to hunger and nutrient deficiencies by utilizing those foods. It's huge. Yeah. I mean, we're in our little camp and we're all into it, but I sometimes don't realize, or maybe people listening who are new to this don't realize that, that those are our foundations and that so much of the mainstream cuts those out and it's, it's insane. And so, okay, you, you, then you started saying we could backfill that with some low FODMAP vegetables. Um, what else? Yeah. Fruits and vegetables. Uh, if you're in a weight loss program, the calorie deficit, about all you're going to eat beyond your protein, because remember the fats are already in the protein for the most mm -hmm. part. Uh, fats are necessary. Every cell in your body has a lipid bilayer that uh, helps transport, you know, vitamins and AD and K in particular. And, uh, so fats are very important. Um, and those, most of those fats are in your protein sources. They're mm -hmm. in your steak, they're in your salmon, they're in your eggs. Uh, you don't really need to endeavor to, to add more, uh, certainly not you know, by throwing a bunch of oils and stuff on your food. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's just unnecessary. And I certainly wouldn't replace any of those whole foods with a, a, you know, a processed oil. Um, again, the nutrient density would, would suffer. The, the protein content would suffer. There's just no reason for it. Um, and so you're going to backfill now with obviously fruits and vegetables is what I recommend. I find fruits easier to digest. Uh, there are some low sugar fruits and they can be high satiety. I mentioned oranges are one of the highest satiety foods on the index. Um, I like to throw a potato in daily. It has twice the amount of potassium as a banana. And for those people who don't uh, suffer from, uh, you know, type two diabetes, uh, even those people with weight loss and um, with uh, you know, the 10 minute walks, which we'll talk about shortly and some, you know, some resistance training and some, some timing, um, uh, can do well with a potato. It depends on the size. And again, this is, this is individualistic. How does your blood sugar respond, uh, to carbohydrates, starchy carbohydrates? I like to throw them in because they're high in potassium. And we see that the potassium helps with a lot of things, helps, uh, with water balance. So you don't get the edema and the, the water retention in the ankles. Uh, it allows you to consume a little more sodium, which helps with, uh, obviously, with your energy levels. Uh, it's one of the, the things that we address in the book is that people who try and restrict sodium to too great a degree can suffer from, uh, I think people called it the keto flu. You get mm -hmm. uh, uh, you get uh, electrolyte deficiencies. Next thing you know, you're tired all the time. You can't perform in the gym. You hit a wall real quick. Uh, and so we like to keep a reasonable amount of salt in. Uh, people can react to over restriction of salt, like they can react to over restriction of any other foods that they typically like by getting into a binging situation mm -hmm. and running out and eating massive amounts of calories like French fries, thinking that they're carb depleted when in fact they're just sodium depleted. So, and we're careful to discuss, you know, salt sensitive individuals who are hypertensive and that's a small portion of, of, uh, of the population. And, uh, and how they can manage that. But there's also people that are reverse salt sensitive. If they get too little salt, they suffer from high blood pressure and dizziness and, and the, that kind of thing. Uh, so 
you know, we like to throw in adequate potassium. You should get over 4,000 milligrams a day uh, is what is commonly recommended. 4,700 possibly is, is uh, kind of what we shoot for. Um, it helps with a lot of things. Also helps, uh, you know, potassium is needed to, uh, to make glycogen, to store glycogen. It uh, binds to glucose. And so it helps with satiety. It helps with uh, sugar cravings. Uh, it helps with the heart palpitations. Uh, there's a whole host of things that, that potassium can help with. So I start with a potato, an orange, yogurt is high in potassium. Meats have 100 milligrams of potassium for every ounce that you consume. Salmon, of course, and the beef. Um, so that builds the kind of the foundation of the diet for a dieter. Now, if you're an active athlete or somebody that's, that's larger, that needs more calories to maintain their muscle mass, uh, or to fuel their workload, a two-a-day CrossFit or a football player, just about any athlete, and even somebody going to the gym training for hypertrophy, you're going to need to fuel that with carbohydrates. I, I prefer to use that as the substrate to fuel anaerobic exercise. We believe it, it optimizes performance for those specific individuals. And if you need a lot of carbohydrates, then you got to be cautious what kind of carbohydrates you're consuming that they don't cause a lot of gas. I, I found that consuming a lot of breads, a lot of pastas or a lot of oatmeal uh, can start to accumulate buildup of gas. And if you're, if you're an athlete, that's not uh, very conducive to performance. And so we use uh, a white rice instead. It's simply for performance. It's just a glucose source uh, that's easy to digest. Um, and you, if, if need be, you can consume more of it and be hungry again sooner if the calories are, are, uh, are of a concern for you. And I deal with a lot of athletes for whom it is. Uh, then oh, I love that's that. Kind of just, just to, just to make sure people heard that right. <laughs> that if you want to eat again, if you, you, you're dealing with people who want to eat more calories. Uh, yes, I'm on both ends of the spectrum. I've, again, I, I've gained and lost over a thousand mm -hmm. pounds throughout my career. I bulked up to over 300 pounds to power lift and set multiple world records. I've dieted down to four percent body fat to compete as an IFBB pro professional bodybuilder. I have different diets. Uh, let's hit on that real quickly because. I have Hofthor Bjornsson as a client and Brian Shaw and a host of other great big athletes, Lane Johnson from the Philadelphia Eagles. I'm even doing a weight gain program for John Jones right now. They need to eat a lot of calories, sometimes five, six, seven, ten thousand 10,000 calories. That tends to turn off a lot of the average population. A lot of the women out there are listening now and they're, they're getting scared. But I also train Tiny Tiff. She's a 103 pound power lifter. And I trained Nadia Wyatt, who's 113 pound, uh, took third in the Miss Olympia two years in a row. Uh, and I mentioned earlier, a 97 pound ballerina from the Sacramento Ballet Company. They both eat the vertical diet. Okay. They both focus on protein leveraging. They both focus on building a foundation of highly bioavailable, micronutrient dense, easy to digest foods. But I have different strategies for them, for the weight loss people. Uh, I'll just hit on like the top four or five things for the weight loss people. I'll have them cook and chew steak instead of ground beef because mechanically it just takes longer to chew. It digests a little slower. It satiates them longer. And we mentioned the thermic effect of food from protein. Uh, I'll have them eat high satiety foods, uh, boiled potatoes and orange, uh, and then high fiber and they'll drink more water with meals in between meals. So, that is how my weight loss people build their diet. My weight gain people will use a ground beef source or bison uh, because it's, uh, it's easier to digest, easier to consume more of it. You, you get hungry again sooner. Uh, they'll use orange juice instead of oranges. Less satiety stimulates appetite. Uh, and just a few ounces, like I use it strategically. It's not to drive calories. And then they'll eat uh, the potassium source, the potatoes, either before workout or before bed, because they do satiate you longer. And those are times that I, uh, you know, strategically, I can put a high satiety food before bed or before workouts, because they're not going to eat again for four hours, uh, at least if they're sleeping, not for eight. And then I'll, I'll introduce the white rice. And one, one strategy I use is I'll have them sprinkle a little bit of dextrose on there. Uh, and that's because it increases saliva and amylase production, both in the mouth and in the liver or the pancreas, it seems that it makes it easier to digest the starch from the rice. And mechanically, uh, it's easier to eat more of it. You're hungry again sooner, so you can eat again sooner. Uh, and then they'll drink less water with meals. 
And those are two completely different strategies using a lot of the same foods uh, for different goals. It's so important because so many people, if you're on social media, like it just, you can't answer these questions. You can't answer people's questions simply when they're saying, because you have no context and they're completely different strategies, but they still have the same foundation, of course, like you just yeah. mentioned. I love that foundation. We're like, we're not sacrificing the good, healthy proteins and fats and the micronutrients. All this stuff is, that's the baseline. We got that covered. Then this is what I found out kind of later as I went on. I think in the beginning, I was a little more closed-minded. I thought I knew things like this is the way to do it. You know, this is what happens. You spend years and years and then you, you see it all and then you kind of come back around. So I'm coming back around and saying, hey, we when, if we get this foundation, like you said, also, you don't, it doesn't matter if you, you fill the rest with carbs or fat, really, right? Because once you get the foundation, you're covered. And then there is this personal preference. There's, there's so much to this that it, it doesn't really matter that much when you get the right foundation, but just so many people get the wrong foundation. Yeah. And that kind of heads me off into a direction that I'm no expert on and that I don't have the answers. And, and to date, I haven't found anybody that does. We've talked about, I think, the big things, the protein leveraging, the high satiety foods, the fiber intake and the compliance. We're speaking to an audience that's pretty disciplined. Right? They exercise regularly, they're healthy. It's a healthy user bias. We tend to smoke less, drink less, exercise more, mm -hmm. uh, and maintain a healthy body weight. That's our audience. It's kind of an echo chamber, to be honest. And I've been in this echo chamber for years. People who follow me you know, tend to agree with me necessarily. Uh, but I do get people from both sides of the spectrum. I get the, the, big, the big guys that are trying to gain weight. And I've got to intervene there because some of that is unhealthy. I've, I've, I did a video where I said, if you want to be healthy, don't compete. Uh, there's a difference between health and fitness. Fitness being the ability to perform a particular duty or task. The fitness level required to be a world's strongest man or a UFC fighter, or even a 14-year-old a, a gymnast at the Olympics or a 10-year-old badminton player in China. The fitness level required to be any of those athletes is not necessarily healthy. You see a lot of injuries. You see probably a lot of uh, metabolic syndrome in the bigger athletes, the high blood pressure, high blood sugars, fatty liver disease, you know, those kinds of things. And the younger athletes, of course, you see, I mentioned, you know, ligament tears and uh, Achilles tendons and, and, you know, carpal tunnel and all kinds of repetitive use injuries for young athletes. So, uh, well, a lot of what I do is I mitigate damage for, for those folks. I, I try and intervene and in, in both nutritionally and uh, with rehab to try and do whatever I can to, to make them better athletes for a longer period of time. Uh, I've emerged from the back end of 30 years of competing in powerlifting, uh, 53 now, uh, and focus mostly on, uh, you know, maintaining my health. I've, you know, knock on wood, never suffered any uh, any permanent injuries, uh, surgeries to speak of, uh, and I've completely rehabilitated my uh, tendonitis in my knees and hips and everything else uh, to where I can train regularly now and, and maintain uh, you know high level of fitness and good blood markers. Uh, so, you know, our group of people benefits from the information we discuss. But to go back to my point, mm -hmm. the greater population, the ones who aren't listening to us. The, where we really have the problem. We have 30% obesity, 70% overweight. Uh, what is it north of probably 80% prediabetes or, or worse? Uh, as we're all seeing from you know, this, this recent pandemic with COVID uh, and they're more susceptible to, uh, you know, to, to poor outcomes from these things because of higher blood pressure and blood sugars and, and those kinds of things. The message that we often preach to these people is, is harder for them to achieve. Mm -hmm. When we tell them, oh, you just need to eat organic foods or uh, grass finished beef or uh, you know, maintain a calorie deficit, that kind of falls on deaf ears to folks who don't have the same level of information or education or uh, they don't have the same amount of time or resources to prepare foods like we do. Uh, maybe they're working two jobs and maybe they're surrounded by uh, a media uh, constantly shoving 
uh, highly processed, uh, ultra palatable, you know, low nutrient density foods. Um, we talk about food deserts. We talk about in these communities, and we talk about uh, the fact that they're surrounded by fast food everywhere they turn. Very affordable. I did a, a rant an obesity rant on the obesity epidemic in Samoa. My wife was born and raised in, in Western and American Samoa until she was 26 years old and her family grew up there. And in Western Samoa, they grew all their own food. They had pigs and chickens that they raised and they planted taro root, which is like a potato. They went out to the ocean and they uh, harvested whatever they could. Uh, a lot of it they sold at the marketplace and traded uh, and bartered for other items. And they grew up on those foods and they had no obesity in their family in Western Samoa. When they moved to American Samoa, uh, they had food stamps. And uh, food stamps empowered people to now do less and eat more. Uh, they no longer grew their own crops. They had a, their marketplace was almost non-existent. Uh, they went down to the store and used those food stamps to buy what three things? You already know what they are. They're sugar, sugar. white flour, and seed oils. Mm -hmm. That is what is predominantly in the stores there. I've been there many times. I've spoken to numerous schools, high schools, uh, about nutrition and about uh, general health. Uh, I've done seminars uh, all throughout Samoa. I've been there many times. And that is what's at the stores. The, the McDonald's is open 24 hours. It's a two-story building. It's packed. There's a line out the door. Parking lot's constantly full. Uh, they're using those food stamps. They, be, they, they went from what I said in my video from being food poor to being food rich. And that is commonly what we see uh, in uh, these industrialized countries as food becomes cheaper and cheaper and more available, uh, people and more highly palatable and lower nutrient dense, these highly processed foods, uh, they're easy to overconsume. That is kind of the foundation of our obesity epidemic. And telling those people to eat more whole foods, which cost twice as much and don't taste as good, uh, has fallen on deaf ears. And so I guess what I say is I don't have the answer to that. And no one obviously does. We've, we continue to spiral out of control with uh, the obesity problem and all these health issues. Some folks, smart folks, I talked a little bit about it in my rant, uh, suggest there might, we might have to subject ourselves to some sort of intervention. Uh, you know, obviously that was tried in New York uh, with uh, uh, the big gulps, mm -hmm. um, but it, it's, you know, it's piecemeal and it's not effective. We saw that in Mexico when they started taxing sugar, they just went to other, you know, untaxed sugars. So I don't have the answer to that, but if we want to talk to a broader audience and not just to our echo chamber already agrees with us and we agree with each other. And, mm -hmm. and usually when we're fighting about something, it's some nuance, it's way down in the weeds and really unimportant. And we agree on probably the top 50 things. Uh, but the bigger problem is what do we do about the, you know, 80 plus percent of, of our society that, that, uh, that, that doesn't comply and, uh, you know, needs this help because they're, uh, their medical conditions are, are out of control. I think about this a lot and it's super hard. Yeah, we are the nerds. We are the people that are into it. So many people, 90% of the people aren't into this. They're not listening to a podcast about health that they're not. Yeah, they don't care. They just go with their life. And, and I understand that because I, the, you know, I've been there and I've in my transition, I've seen all, I have different friends and they, they will just, they won't even listen to me. They'll do all the same things. They're, health will decrease while my health has increased and they just do not care. So my, I have two solutions. I have two ideas. I know I do agree with you. It's super impossible. I don't want to say impossible. It's super, super hard. I don't want to get into taxing and you know, all this stuff, but one, I guess is just the film is get the information out there. So that's just a broad idea is if we get a film like food lies on Netflix, then and it's super entertaining like you know that's why it's taking so long we're just gonna do the best film we possibly can get it on the biggest platforms possible maybe that can make a difference and two something more specifically that i'm trying to say more that i think can reach the bigger audience and tell me what you think is just say hey what you, you like meat right you are a human humans like red meat if we give them the green light Say whatever you're eating, take your diet. I did a tweet on this. I was going to do another Instagram post, another one, just very simply saying, you just replace some of, some of your processed foods with more meat. 
What if you just did that? Say like, okay, you're eating this amount of meat. If people add it up, they're actually probably not even that much meat, right? When they really add it up, you're like, you fast food meal, there's only a thin burger patty. That's the only meat in your fast food meal, right? So it's just to say, let's double your meat. Whatever you're doing, double your meat, do, and then something else will have to fall. Like, well, yeah, don't get the soda. Don't get the soda. Don't, if, if, if people can get that message, if they are allowed to eat meat, some of these people don't even think that that's a healthy idea. So if we give them permission to double their meat, and then they'd have to drop off calories somewhere, hopefully, unless they're just <laughs> going to eat more, which is going to be a, a problem. But I think that's my new idea is it's take the worst foods out and replace it with more meat, maybe. And then people can still, I think they can still be satisfied and eat well. What do you think? Well, you're right on target. They can be satisfied. It's higher satiety. It has a higher uh, uh, a thermic effect of food. So they're they're going to net out fewer calories than what they would if they were eating a highly palatable food that's, uh, and those highly palatable foods are a combination of fats and sugars. It's, mm -hmm. it's not one or the other. Um, here's the challenge. And this is goes way back to when we implemented the food pyramid is we fear mongered about saturated fat. And there's some, there's some sense to that. If you're talking about bacon and butter, but saturated fats from whole food sources, uh, are very low. Let's take a top sirloin steak. It's about 9% saturated fat. It's, uh, it's about maybe 30% fat as a total, uh, in terms of total calories. So yeah, I'd want to use some leaner meats. I'd want to use some salmon. I'd want to use some top sirloin steak. Uh, the ribeyes, you know, probably fine here and there, but it's better than the alternative, which is the fat oils in the deep fried foods or that are used in uh, things like, you know, cakes and desserts and those kinds of things are certainly better than that. And it has a higher, again, protein leveraging. It has a higher uh, protein per calorie ratio. And that's important. The problem is, is it's twice as expensive. And we're subsidizing a lot of these crops that allow these foods to be so cheap. And I would love to see the subsidies, uh, you know, directed at the kinds of foods that, that that you're mentioning, that I've mentioned, that would allow people to eat more affordably, uh, eat higher protein foods more affordably, higher protein whole foods more affordably, uh, then it might be a little more reasonable. Uh, one of the challenges that, that you find in making these recommendations, again, is it goes back to compliance, and compliance is, is you know, kind of hugely uh, uh, built upon satiety, and none of those highly processed foods are satiated. Uh, you just, you can overconsume and you're hungry again really fast. Some of the things I try and do in my book and that is to give people tools. It's easy to sit here and complain about what the problem is. Hey, you should eat more of this and that and the other, but sometimes that doesn't even work for disciplined people. So in the book, I talk about compliance is the science. Uh, the best diet's the one you'll adhere to. And so I try and give strategies and, and this has been studied. We've, uh, we've had lots of studies showing what types of behaviors allow people to be more successful in dieting. Uh, one of the key behaviors is meal prepping. If you can cook and prepare your meals, this is the reason bodybuilder figure physique bikini people are so successful in their diets. They, have, they carry Tupperwares around with them every day. Mm -hmm. Kind of a pain in the ass, but uh, you know, the alternative is, of course, that you just get hungry and then you, you know, pull into a Carl's Jr. And, and next thing you know, your calories for the week are, are blown because uh, you're just eating uh, beyond, you know, satiety. You're just completely stuffing yourself. So uh, I use something called a thermos, you, you know, that, that uh, keeps the food warm. And I travel all over the world. I've been in 10 countries in all 50 states. I've done over 200 seminars in the last three years. And I travel all the time and I take my meals with me. I'll, I'll put some frozen meal preps in a, in a carry-on bag or a, a checkup, if, depending on how long I'm gone for. I'll have a couple thermos with me that I fill with a hot meal. I'm never cooking one meal. When I wake up and cook breakfast, I'm cooking three meals. The one I'm eating and the two I'm going to take with me to get me through my day. Even when I'm at home, I do that. I work from home when I'm home. When I'm traveling, I take those two meals and I put them in my carry-on bag and I put them under my seat. And every four hours or so, and I know that's, uh, you know, a, a burden that I've created, I, I call it 
uh, I call myself a victim of circumstance. I, mm -hmm. I want this 240 pound body at 8%. Well, it requires me to eat 4,500 calories a day and four to five meals a day. So mm -hmm. I know that's not everybody's problem, but that's, you know, still currently my situation. And I can manage that responsibly and consistently with meal prep. That's one of the, the, the most effective methods. Uh, that's why I started a meal prep company. I had many people approach me about starting a supplement company. And of course, I'm uh, somewhat popular for saying shakes are for fakes eat steaks. <laughs> uh, but uh, I've just never been a big fan of, of supplements. I always have focused on whole foods. Uh, first, you know, there's a place for supplements, but it's, you know, it's a supplement. It's not a priority and it's not to, to be used in the exclusion of a meal. So, um, and so that's a, a big one for compliance. We mentioned uh, obviously the protein leveraging and, and higher satiety foods and, and fiber. But also I think that, that we tell people they have to do too much in terms of uh, energy expenditure. We, we instruct them to go to the gym and do 40 minutes of cardio on a treadmill every night. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, not only is that not terribly effective, but it's, it's very boring and not sustainable. Uh, there's too many barriers to entry. You got to get changed, get in your car, drive to the gym, and then you got kids and you know, all whole, whole host of other things. The exercise component of weight loss uh, is very minor, the requirement, and not terribly effective. More exercise does not equal more weight loss. But we try and convince people that they have to go to the gym and do battle ropes and jump up and down and, mm -hmm. and breathe heavy and sweat. Nobody's going to do that consistently. They're just not. If that's your thing and it's my thing, but mm -hmm. I can't assume that everybody wants to go to the gym and sweat and get tired and breathe and all that stuff. Most people don't. And the, the nice, the neat thing is you don't have to. Uh, so that's why I implemented the 10 minute walks. You can take a 10 minute walk uh, after a couple of meals. I, I recommend three meals daily, just as soon as you're done eating within 15 minutes thereof, go take a 10 minute walk. It's sustainable. You can do it anywhere. You don't need anything special to do it. If the weather's terrible, you can get a recumbent bike, put it in your living room, do a 10 minute recumbent bike. It has so many benefits. Blood sugar control being one of the major ones. It's twice as effective as metformin for preventing or reversing type 2 diabetes. As studied, twice as effective. It decreases the peak and duration of glucose elevation and right behind, of course, the area under the curve for insulin. And so that's a very healthy option for uh, managing blood sugars. I don't use it for weight loss per se. I don't throw cardio at calories. I think it's a dead end game. Mm -hmm. uh, it's great for digestion, obviously. Uh, just the, the mechanism of, of, of the stomach, the muscles moving. Um, it's also good for general health. It elevates your heart rate. Uh, you know, it's a brisk walk. It's intentional. Uh, it's not sprinting or running, but it's, uh, it does get your heart rate up a little bit. Great for stress release. It's fantastic. Uh, and again, sustainable. I, I do them everywhere. I've been doing them for many, many, many years. Whether I'm traveling, I'm at a hotel. I go to a restaurant and eat, I walk out the door and I, I set my timer for five minutes and I walk down the street, turn around and walk back before I get in my car. I can do them anywhere, anytime at the airport when I'm, everybody's standing there waiting for their luggage. I'm the idiot that's walking around mm -hmm. the turnstiles, uh, getting my 10 minute walking. And so that's important that you do get the regular exercise. Resistance training is huge. It's a sink for glucose. Dr. Gabrielle Lyons has talked extensively about this. She's hundred percent right. Uh, weightlifting is more important than cardio. Weightlifting can be and is cardio anyhow. Mm -hmm. um, for maintaining lean body mass and providing a, a sink again for glucose to keep your blood sugars under control, uh, especially while you're dieting, you just need to do some sort of resistance training. And I don't care what it is, it can be bands, it can be push-ups, it can be air squats. You can do them, you know, right after your 10 minute walk, do hundred air squats and, you know, 50 push-ups in a, however many sets that takes. Uh, twice a week is about it. Here's why I caution against, a, a, two reasons why I caution against uh, prescribing or uh, suggesting more for people who are trying to lose weight in terms of energy expenditure, how much work uh, you do. Uh, one reason is that it's not terribly uh, easy for people to comply with long-term. The second reason is compensation. Mm -hmm. The harder that you work, you go to the gym and do a CrossFit session, uh, the more likely it is you're gonna come home and eat more and sit more. 
That's a huge problem. When people start exercise programs, and can't figure out why they're not losing weight. They, what tends to happen is they get tired and they eat more food and they sit more. And the energy expenditure, the deliberate workout, does not burn as many calories as the non-exercise activity thermogenesis, just staying on your feet and being active throughout the day. Yeah. That 30 or 40 minutes of, of, of gym time does not burn as many calories as just being active all day. So I would much prefer to minimize the gym time and have you be more active. Stay on your feet, move around. I love that. I got to jump in because I just remembered one of my first episodes of this podcast over three years ago, Dr. Zoe Harcomb from the UK yeah. mentioning this. She said, do the math. People don't even do the math of you, you expend calories just being around in life. Yeah. And so you're not burning that much more when you're out on that stupid treadmill. So it's super huge. And I'll just throw in a few more things before I let you back in. 10 minute walks, genius, huge. Everyone's got to do it. And I had a CGM a while back and I saw that blood glucose, uh, lower peak, lower like duration. Oh my God, it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, and then with the lifting stuff, two, twice a week, that's all I'm at right now. I'm in a maintenance, I'm, I've never been a big guy, but I find I can maintain, I, I think I can gain a little muscle doing my two 25 minute workouts. It's sustainable, it yep. works for me, I'm not, yeah, I'm not doing cardio. I'm not getting crazy sweaty. I'm, I'm just going in there. I'm doing my resistance training. Yeah, I use a weight vest so I can, and, and drop sets. And I, I wanna know your take on that too. And I, I can do a simple and effective workout in 20 minutes. I mean, I call it 25, but um, yeah, yeah. What, what do you think? <laughs> I think that's great. And I've been in that position myself. I have a gym in my garage. And sometimes when I'm really, really busy, I still want to get in my minimum effective volume. I still want to be consistent. That's the key here. It's not what you do at any one workout. It's what you string together over the course of you know, a lifestyle. And uh, like you mentioned, drop sets, those kinds of things allow you to do more work in less time. And so I usually put together supersets. You go in, you do a dip, rest for a minute, do a chin up, rest for a minute, do a dip, rest for a minute, do a chin up. And then you can go over and do a, you know, a leg press or a squat and rest for a minute and do some sort of hamstring exercise. Uh, you know, chin-ups get your biceps and dips get your triceps. You don't need a whole lot of extra time to do those. Uh, you're not, a, you know, most of the people that we're talking to aren't bodybuilders. It's completely unnecessary. Uh, and just with those four exercises, maybe a, an overhead press or a side lateral tossed in here and there, uh, although your your bench work or your dip work is going to get some shoulders anyhow. Uh, those are multi-joint movements, and they involve a lot of muscle groups, and you can do them very quickly, particularly if you superset them, and be in and out of the gym, like you said, in 20, 25 minutes. You don't need an extraordinary amount of warm-up. Just use a lighter weight. I'll put a band over the dip and put my knee or foot on it, and so I start with a little lighter weight. Same with a chin-up. You can wrap a band around the bar, put your foot in it, and do some lighter chin-ups if uh, if either you can't do full chin-ups or you're just trying to warm up, uh, you don't need 30 minutes of prehab and foam rolling and you know, <laughs> running all around. And None of that. You just don't need it. Just work the muscles. Uh, and I, I put a whole chart in the book, uh, uh, in my ebook by Brett Contreras, a PhD. We're all familiar with him, the glute guy, uh, that walks you step by step through what's necessary and just kind of helps you uh, get rid of uh, some of the time consuming stuff that really doesn't give you a return on your investment and twice a week, 20, 25 minutes. That's all it takes. It's amazing. It's the greatest lifestyle. And yeah, I, I, I do the same thing. This kind of super set mixed with drop sets. It's I, I go in there and I can do my dips and then the next one I'll do my squats and then I'll go back to some shoulders. Then I'll go back to some, you know, squats. So I'm, I'm alternating to let myself rest. And then I'm doing a two drop sets, dropping in weight for each one so I can hit it hard and be done. Yeah, there is a little, I'll give you the little step-by-step -step here. You'd like to do everything twice a week. Mm -hmm. And you're doing that. You just go and you go and do your whole body Monday and your whole body Friday. Uh, if you wanted to break it down and do more, you could do upper Monday, lower Tuesday, upper Thursday, lower Friday, mm -hmm. if you had the time and, and if it was something you enjoyed. But either one, doesn't matter, as long as you're getting in twice a week. You like to do, I think, minimum effective volume, you know, just for maintenance is probably, for strength, maybe six sets a week. For bodybuilding, 
uh, maybe 10 sets a week. So you go on Monday and you do five sets of chest. You go on Friday, you do five sets of chest. Five sets of, of each body part is mm -hmm. what you do. Five dips, five chin-ups, five squats, five hamstring curls. You're done. In and out. And if you're supersetting them, that happens in under 20 minutes. Do that twice a week. The uh, rep range. So now we've talked about frequency. We've talked about volume. So let's talk about rep range. You can build just as much muscle lifting a heavy set of five reps as you can a medium set of 12 reps, as you can a light set of 20 reps. It doesn't matter. It's your personal preference. You're going to get a little stronger, obviously, lifting the fives. But they all give equivalent hypertrophy outcomes, assuming you get within two or three reps of failure. So that's your intensity component. So we talked frequency twice a week. We talked volume, about 10 sets a week per body part. We talked uh, about the rep range, which fives, 12s, and 20s are all equivocal. I will say this on rep range. The 12 rep sets tend to incur the least fatigue. The fives make you a little more tired, a little more DOMS, a little delayed onset muscle soreness. Uh, and the 20s also tend to make you a little more fatigued. So that's why a lot of bodybuilders have historically trained in that, you know, eight to 15 rep range. It seems to be the sweet spot. They'll throw in an occasional five here and finish with an AMRAP or a set of 20 and as many reps as possible there. Uh, just to, you know, have a variety. That, that's, that's fine. You can do that. Have one top set of five and finish your last set with a set of uh, as many reps as you can with a lighter weight. Uh, and then, but the intensity is kind of a key component there. So if you go into the gym and you do 10, a, a set of 10 and you put it on 20, probably not going to continue to get results on that. And so you, you have to continually kind of get within two or three reps of failure, which you can predict over time as you get better. Usually when your speed slows down, when you're benching and you're doing one, two, three, four, you can stop right there. As soon as your speed slows down, it means you've achieved maximum muscle fiber recruitment and some are dropping off. Maximum muscle fiber recruitment is all you need. Mm. And now your muscles can adapt. And then there should be some sort of progression over time. Mm -hmm. Add a little bit of weight or one rep or one extra set. That'll help you if, if, uh, if maintenance is, is not your goal and you actually want to build muscle over time. Uh, and I think lastly, the rest periods is something that we've talked a lot about recently. For hypertrophy, it's ideal to rest about two minutes between sets. You get down below that and it's not optimal for hypertrophy. It's uh, more muscular endurance, more of a cardiovascular uh, influence. It, great for lean tissue maintenance, there's no question. Uh, but if you want to build muscle tissue, uh, about a two minute rest period. That's why I like to do a dip, rest a minute, do a chin up, rest a minute. Now the time between dips mm -hmm. is a little over two minutes mm -hmm. and that helps keep maintain my strength throughout the workout. So I'm not, I'm not dropping off. If I do a dip, rest 30 seconds, do a dip, rest 30 seconds, do a dip. You're going to be able to do fewer and fewer reps or your weights are going to come down. You'll have to pull weight off the bar to get the same number of reps. That's not optimal for hypertrophy. You'd like to, to maintain that, that strength uh, or reps throughout the workout. Those are the big rocks. And I, I have a chart like that in my vertical diet ebook that helps you walk through that step by step. Uh, but that's really, I mean, that's the science of it. That's what the guys like Brett Contreras and Brad Schoenfeld have in their books. Uh, Brad's new book, Hypertrophy. Uh, that's, that's, that's the nuts and bolts of it right there. It is. Yeah. And I'm, I've interviewed other of these researchers, the, the Stu Phillips. I mean, he, yeah. he echoed all of this. He's like, I go in there, I do, you know, I do it quickly and I'm out. And it's super simple. I'm glad you just gave five minutes on the, the best five minutes people can ever <laughs> get on, on the recap of like how to build muscle, how to get in the gym. So yeah. that's awesome. I, you know, you have so much more people can find other resources from you, but I want to ask about carbs and muscle growth, because if we're talking about the last part of your diet, after you get your foundation settled, uh, I think, so a lot of people in the more keto world, they're like, I'm going to backfill that with fat, right? And I like to mm -hmm. run fat and it's perfectly good. And I love it. And I did it for years. And now I'm, you know, I'm messing around in between, but why is, why are carbs better for muscle growth in your opinion? And what sign I know you, I, I'm remembering a couple of years ago, you went on Saladino's podcast and talked about yeah. this. So yeah, I'll that reiterate that. Yeah. But I'll first say that not everybody agrees on this. Menno Henselman, who's an excellent resource, uh, has debated Mike Israetel, another excellent resource, about this very topic. And they both believe uh, 
uh, Menno believes you can build just as much muscle on a high fat diet uh, and, and carbs are of minimal need. And, and uh, Mike Israchel believes just the opposite. He thinks that obviously you should get an adequate amount of fats uh, for general health, but fats beyond that, which provides you the health benefit don't necessarily contribute to performance. Mm. And so, uh, Mike Israel tells in the carb side, um, <clears throat> there's a number of other, you know, competitive athletes that believe that as well, uh, that are in the academic, uh, Lane Norton, uh, I'm trying to think of some more here off the top of my head that, that are highly regarded, but, uh, here's what I told, uh, Paul Saladino on his website, on, on his podcast, and he was fully carnivore and keto at the time. He's mm-hmm. since, he's since added in some carbs for workouts and as has, um, uh, 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 his name up there at, um, uh, I don't know why it keeps escaping me, but let me just dive into we'll, it. We'll explain it. All right. Maybe I'll know who it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it'll come Mike yeah. Mutzel. I'm oh, sorry. Mike. I was yeah, on Mike yeah. Mutzel. Metabolic yeah. Mike. Yeah. Up in Seattle area. Yeah. He started throwing in some carbs just around workouts, but stayed mm-hmm. keto most of the time. He just used it to fuel workouts. And here's my main reason why uh, is because the carbohydrates are the preferable fuel for uh, anaerobic performance. And uh, you can do kind of like with creatine taking creatine. It seems you can do an extra set an extra rep, uh, you can train a little harder, a little longer, and the cumulative benefit of that over time uh, provides you uh, an improved hypertrophy benefit. Here's what has been discussed by Greg Knuckles and on Mass Research Review and some other, and this is also in, in, um, in uh, <clears throat> Brad Schoenfeld's book. The muscle doesn't store glycogen uh, in just one place. It stores glycogen um, inside the contractile fibers, uh, particularly around uh, when your when your muscles fire. The I mentioned how important calcium is for muscle contraction, and the carbs that are stored in the endoplasmic reticulum or in that area help release the calcium. At a, at a greater rate, which helps with muscle fiber contraction and relaxation. The, those are the first carbs that are burned, that are utilized in training. So we used to think that carbs were stored kind of like gas in a car. You could drive uh, you know, 100 miles an hour in a car with a full tank or a quarter tank. It didn't matter, right? And that's how we used to think of carbohydrates in the muscle, that you never really depleted them to the point where it, it, it could affect performance. Then we find out that carbs aren't stored like that. It's more like a balloon full of air. A full balloon is compared to a quarter full Mm, balloon, mm -hmm. more of a pressure Mm -hmm. uh, type of thing. So when if you release that balloon, it has more explosiveness, the fuller balloon does. And uh, this kind of a poor summary, but that's kind of the gist of of the the conversation is that the the carbs that are stored in the endoplasmic reticulum Uh, are the first carbs that are used, and those do have uh, an increased effect on calcium release, which has an effect on muscle fiber contraction. Now, a lot of folks will say this is probably not meaningful to most people. Uh, The vast majority of people probably do not train long enough or hard enough or need that extra 1% Mm -hmm. as a competitive athlete. And I would I would concur that this, this is a conversation that's kind of uh, just for elite athletes, cross, competitive CrossFitters, football players training twice a day, you know, at the college or professional level, et cetera. Uh, so it, it might not be a huge deal, but uh, I just feel that when you're in the gym and I say the same thing about sodium, getting out of having adequate sodium in your diet, and maybe even taking a little bit of sodium before training is that, you tend not to hit the wall as quick. You, you just tend to be able to do more sets, more reps for a longer period of time. And if so inclined, um, you know, you would stay there and do more work and that work, that volume over time is going to result in a greater benefit. I say the same thing about fasting. Before. I don't like to train fasting. You just get tired sooner. You, you, you might do one less rep or five less pounds or one less set. And the cumulative benefit of that over time is what matters. So, not a huge impact in any one workout and for most people, but 
if you're trying to optimize performance and you want to feel really good in the gym and get the pump mm -hmm. and, and not hit a wall and have lots of energy and everything just feels like it's, mm -hmm. it's firing, then I like the salt and I like the carbs. That uh, that seems to help make the workout more enjoyable. All right, that was really great because I think it does come down to people's preference and it comes down to, like you said, 99% of people aren't out there trying to train at the highest level. I always bring up my decathlon, why well, I trained for a pentathlon because that was all that was available two years ago. And I just did it on, on just fat and I didn't eat any carbs just to prove I could do it. I did it fasted too. It wasn't optimal. I'm sure I should have eaten. I didn't even eat the whole day. I did the whole pentathlon, five events, you know, yeah. came in second. It, it was a big, big event, whatever, beat, beat most people. But it's just, I, I just wanted to do it to prove that we don't. There's, there's this idea that you need carbs. It's like, you can't sprint without carbs or you can't do this without carbs. Like I was out there, I did it. And I yeah. mean, I was fat adapted for a couple of years actually before I did it. Yeah. And so maybe that's why people don't know it's possible because no one's putting in the time to get truly fat adapted and get really good at doing this and burning fat and yeah you know you're more right about endurance athletics uh peter atia was a perfect example of that you know he, he had done a lot of ultra uh, endurance athletics uh on doing keto uh and liked it he said his improvement in per, his increase it took him mm -hmm. like six months to actually see an improvement in performance most people don't have the kind of stamina to to endure that that intervention but um but ultimately now, Peter Atia too, he's eating carbs because he's doing more hypertrophy training, uh, more anaerobic lifting, and he just kind of likes the way he feels better in the gym. Uh, you mentioned something else that I wanted to touch on. Oh, psychological as opposed to physiological. Um, physiologically, you probably don't need the carbs. Uh, psychologically, some people are just tired. And I mentioned you just feel better when you're training. If you have a little salt and a little bit of carbs, you just get in there and just mm -hmm. emotionally, uh, psychologically, just feel better. And that can have a huge impact on, mm -hmm. on your performance. Um, and especially if it's at the end of the day and you had a busy day and you've been at work and you've been, you know, had a lot of stress and what have you, it weighs heavy on you psychologically. But what we found is, and what my co-author Damon McCune studied as part of his PhD, um, was just mouth rinsing with a carbohydrate drink that you didn't actually swallow, mm. gave you the same performance benefit as drinking a carbohydrate drink. And wow. Menno Hensman just wrote something recently about the same thing, and he said it didn't even have to be a carbohydrate drink. It could be, uh, it could be a, a flavored, uh, you know, zero calorie drink, and, and mouth rinsing instead of swallowing. That that kind of thing could have a psychological impact. I think it's why a lot of people love their pre workouts. They get addicted to the taste. I mean, obviously, most of those are loaded with caffeine, give you yeah. a little jump. And, uh, but physiologically, the performance benefits from caffeine, you have to take a significant amount of it to show a measurable difference in performance. Uh, I think it's um, like four to eight milligrams per kilogram. So I, I think you're looking at at, at 600 milligrams of caffeine mm. uh, for you know a hundred kilogram person, a 200, 220 pound person, 600 milligrams of caffeine to actually experience a uh, performance benefit. But just a little bit of caffeine, uh, maybe 50 milligrams or hundred milligrams, like a caffeine theanine blend to give you that kind of mental focus can have a huge impact just on how you feel. And then you can perform better as a result. The feeling is important to me because if, again, if people think that, that this is an exhausting, uh, unpleasurable experience, what's the likelihood they're going to repeat it consistently mm -hmm. and compliance again is the science. This is great. Yeah. And even just, just that like quick energy carbs and some easily digestible carbs can give you that quick energy that maybe that's all you need to have a good workout. And yes, I've had bad workouts before and yeah, you're not going to gain from them. It's like, yes, you get to do it and you get some benefits from it, but if you want to, you know, have a good workout, then there are, I, I, I didn't even know about the, the mouth rinsing. That's really cool. It's crazy. It's psychological. It, it, you just build up stress over time, uh, over the course of the day. I will say the International Society of Sports Nutrition does still recommend uh, carb loading for the three days prior to endurance events. They, they do feel as though in their, uh, uh, in their literature, they have position stands on a host of these different topics, macros, micronutrients, supplements, et cetera, on their website, the Journal of International Society of Sports Nutrition. 
That's Dr. Jose Antonio down there. Have you had him on your show? I'm, no. I can't recall. No, no. Yeah. Brilliant guy. He's, he does a lot of the protein overfeeding studies mm. and, and the like. Um, they do recommend uh, carbs for endurance performance as well. Uh, and But it, it's a significant amount of carb loading, more than we thought before. My dad used to run marathons way back in the early 70s. He even ran in the Boston Marathon at one time. Uh, and he would try eating, you know, big, huge bowls of spaghetti the night before and always be bloated the next day. Mm -hmm. They're suggesting a three day load, about 600 to 1000 grams of carbs, really, uh, for some athletes for three full days, let's say Wednesday, Thursday, Friday before a Saturday competition. And then if it's an ultra endurance competition, something that exceeded two hours, uh, about every 20 to 30 minutes during that event, you'd like to get some sort of blend of, of, uh, of sugar. Uh, usually two sugars because they uh, they absorb twice the rate when you use two different sugars. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, uh, like a dextrose and a maltodextrin mm -hmm. or a dextrose and a fructose, doesn't matter. And a little bit of salt as well. And that's uh, usually 500 milligrams to two grams per liter of water, depending on what your salt sweat rate is. And that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. is individualistic as well. But that's their recommendation if you want to fuel ultra long endurance performance. I wonder, I mean, I talked to Zach Bitter on the show and you, people may know him from being meat-based and fat-based. And yeah, I mean, I know he does use some some of those things you mentioned, the dextrose and stuff during the race, but it sounds like he does more fat-based metabolism for these type of things and doesn't so much carbo load as use them strategically during his race. So I'm just wondering, I mean, I have no problem with athletes doing all of the things you said. I'm just wondering if it's just based on what we know that most athletes are car based and this is just what we know and this is the science that we we look at you know it's interesting you said that because part of the debate uh discussion that mike israel had with menno mike kept referencing what we've always done what most bodybuilders did what most athletes did and the, i don't know that that's a great argument to be honest with you uh although science tends to confirm over time what the majority of people have done historically to, to achieve optimal performance. Uh, there are certainly folks that, have, you know, do things that, uh, that are successful in spite of themselves. But when you look at the vast majority of, of athletes, that's why I mentioned I'm agnostic. If, if eating a vegan diet, you know, if, if there were a ton of great athletes, uh, you know, if the majority of great athletes were doing it and getting results from it, I'd be all over it. I, I, I don't care. Uh, but it seems like the majority of great athletes, and I've been going down to Venice and watching, you know, bodybuilders and the train since the, the, the late 80s. I used to drive from Oregon all the way down to Southern California just to sit and watch them train. Um, and in talking to them, they all train twice a day. They all trained with the same kind of methods that we just discussed. They all ate six times a day, napped every afternoon and slept nine hours a night. Those were, that was the foundation of the questions that I asked. Uh, those were the answers I got most consistently and they were in there pounding away, building muscle. And uh, obviously that's one, one sport. Uh, that's the one I was most familiar with, but um, in training track athletes and football players at the University of Oregon, I, I tended to find the same thing. And you're right, uh, the majority of people do it. I don't know if that makes it better than the alternative, um, but uh, that, that's probably what's dictated oh, most of, of, yeah. of the decisions for people to follow. Well, it, it doesn't really matter to me. Yeah. So uh, I just think that that might contribute to it. And if anyone, Zach Bitter is world record holder for ultra marathons, if people don't know who we're talking about. So he's, he's doing a lot of things. And uh, yeah. so let's, let's wrap up. I want to ask a few quicker questions here. Yeah. So well, one, I think it's great. You've done monthly blood tests for 12 years. Yeah. Well, since I was 20, I started getting blood tests, you know, relatively oh, infrequently. Yeah. But from the time I went back to competition in 2006 until today, I do blood tests on almost a monthly basis, sometimes every two months, uh, to monitor kind of how my body responded. Uh, as you know, I've, I've, I've kind of I've changed a lot over the years, gaining weight, losing weight. Mm -hmm. uh, and just to see how I respond to everything that, that I was doing and putting myself through through all those years. And so I learned a lot along the way about that process. And that's some of the things I do for my athletes. You know, I mentioned mitigating damage when I come across a big athlete that's got metabolic syndrome or I come across a, um, a, a small athlete that's got you know the female triad. 
uh, I could see those things in blood testing and then I could try and implement some sort of methods that, uh, you know, diet and exercise and sleep methods that, uh, that help uh, improve those numbers because th those things can uh, manifest in all kinds of, of, uh, of problems we talked about earlier. What's a female triad just so people know? Yeah, women who lose a lot of weight, particularly in athletes, runners, distance runners, et cetera, or, uh, they'll, they'll end up with uh, iron deficiency, anemia, uh, amenorrhea, cessation of the menstrual period, and then uh, 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 bone mineral loss, calcium deficiency. And we, and we see that in runners a lot of times that'll end up with shin splints they get more commonly uh, with them uh, because they, uh, they, they go on a kind of pretty strict diet, lose too much weight, and all of those things happen. And then, of course, their thyroid uh, slows. This happens in the fitness and physique industry. And again, sadly so, a lot of the soccer moms who are copying those diets, their thyroid will slow. And then that brittle hair that comes from biotin deficiency starts falling out. Uh, it's tragic, and and usually they end up at the doctor's office. I mentioned getting shots for all those things, but they also end up getting antidepressants at the same time. Mm, it's sad, and so a lot of these problems. People say this happens in the keto community, and I think a lot of it is there. It's too much calorie restriction for one thing. It's like yes. all the things you mentioned are from too much calorie restriction. I see it in some of these women I've seen online that have had problems, and they're like. So you, you can say, well, yes, you're just not eating enough. And then it's also because it sounds like they're not eating enough red meat. Some of these things. It's, it, they're micronutrient deficient. We talked yeah. about that. Yeah, not getting enough iron, not getting enough biotin. Yeah. Uh, and, and some of them cut out uh, you know, sugars. And, and uh, I think that's important for the liver. For T4 is converted to T3 in the liver, about 80% of it. And you need a little bit of uh, liver glycogen to make that happen. Plus your, you know, your brain fuels off of that. And so just a, just a little bit. Um, and we also see that with thyroid deficiency, iodine deficiency, it's just the restriction, the rate of weight loss matters. The lack of sleep matters Overtraining. A lot of these women will do 40 minutes of treadmill twice a day. Um, you know, just these chronic deficiencies. And so, uh, a lot of that, you want to lose weight more slowly or, uh, have diet breaks, uh, here and there. So you can fuel your body adequately. Uh, these it's once you've got it, you, you kind of have to gain some weight back mm -hmm. and, uh, to fix it. You can't just keep dieting and, and yeah. like take B12 vitamin or something. It doesn't fix the problem. Yeah. And you're talking about thyroid stuff and your, your body. Yeah. Okay. Well, this brings me to the kind of pro metabolic world and Ray Pete. And I've been talking to more people about this stuff and it sounds like you, the vertical diet is kind of using some of those principles of of using carbohydrates to support the metabolism and thyroid and stuff like that. So uh, what do you think? Yeah, you know, I've read a lot of Ray Pete's stuff, certainly listened to a lot of the stuff that he's done. I've read a lot of people's stuff. And, I, mm -hmm. you know, that, that doesn't mean that they support what I do. And, and I certainly don't agree with everything that, that anyone says, uh, you know, uh, but I, 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 like I said, I mentioned I, all the people that I read, um, Andy Galpin, Dr. Andy Galpin, Mike Isriatel, Menno Henselman, uh, uh, Brad Schoenfeld, Lane Norton. I mean, your show, I follow all the people. I, I'm just, you're probably the same way. I can't get enough information in a day. Uh, and mm -hmm. I, I read a lot of books and watch a lot of videos and read a lot of research and collaborate with my partner. Uh, and so, you know, I try and pull from that uh, um, information that's helpful, but I'm cautious to make sure that I've tried it and it works for me and I've utilized it on my clients and it works for the majority of them. And I'm always cautious to say, as I did in the Swiss seminar, what works for me might not work for you. And what works for most people doesn't work for everyone. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just because uh, I mentioned something that somebody says doesn't mean I agree with everything they say, uh, but that's just where I found it. And then I try and find the research to support it. So, yeah, you know, a lot of stuff in my book comes from a lot of places, it comes from the Weston A. Price Foundation. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Ray Pete, certainly kind of a foundation. And a lot of the things that I've learned over the years. But um, I, I do believe that that uh, it is helpful. I think fat burns a carbohydrate flame for, for most folks. And um, I think the big problem, like you mentioned, with people uh, in the keto flu is, is uh, 
not necessarily carbohydrates, but more electrolytes. I, I do think if you're going to do the keto diet, understand that you're going to lose glycogen from the muscles and that glycogen is 70% water. Uh, and that water has a significant amount of electrolytes in it, sodium in particular. And so you're going to need to, to supplement that and just put salt on your food uh, and get adequate water intake more consistently and more water because it's not going to store as well in the body. You're going to lose that five pounds or so of water initially. And that's water that your body, you know, was using. And you need to find a way to get those electrolytes into your system. And so that's any of these pathways. I have keto clients. I have vegan clients that have mm -hmm. trained for competition. I have clients that intermittent fast. Uh, it's all a matter of personal preference. I just let them know, hey, here's some, some potential uh, pitfalls that we should manage uh, with these interventions, so whether it's supplementation, uh, or like I just mentioned about keto, uh, or whether training in the fed state as opposed to a fasted state optimized performance if you are going to do intermittent fasting. And so there's just little things here and there that, that I would advise just to make the process easier for someone who chooses that path. I love it. My camp is not being in a camp. And I think that's where you're at. And almost everyone I know just in the nutrition world, they, they do choose a camp. It's super hard not to. And I definitely did choose my camp earlier in my life. And, yeah. and so even with the pro metabolic crowd, I like to you know see what they're up to and listen to what they have to say, but they still, they're like, oh, if you don't eat five times a day, you're screwed, you're stressed, you're, you're gonna die. And you know, they have all these things. It's like, you cannot, you know, if you're eating, not, you know, intermittent fasting, not even for 16 hours, that's insane. If you're not doing this, you're insane. So I love yeah. to just pick and choose. Or, or they, how would I say this? They exaggerate the benefits of it and, or try and make it seem superior to an alternate path mm -hmm. when it probably isn't. Whether you intermittent fast or you do keto or, uh, you know, however you choose. There's no magic that happens. It's not like, that's you know, it. all of a sudden that's yeah. probably it's in my book. It's not magic. Well, that's, that's what I say about my diet. It's not magic. Well, that's what I'm trying to say is like, if I'm getting all the protein I need and all these fats and, you know, these micros and macros and micros, and I'm getting in two meals or I'm getting four meals, it's not magic, like either way. No. And stress management, adequate sleep and regular exercise. You hit the nails on the head there. Yeah, it's it's just what works for you. This is like what you're all about in the beginning. You're talking about it's just about the compliance and the consistency. All this stuff is what really matters. And it's personal preference. And I, I love that you start with a questionnaire, too. I don't work with that many patients. Uh, I do with a little bit with Dr. Gary back in L.A., but I do start with them like, OK, what do you like? Do you like, if you are obsessed with salads, then maybe we're going to have to go down this salad route, which could be fine. I'm just not in that salad game. I'm, you know, I'm in the meat game. So, yeah. I, but I want to know what you are going to stick to. Cause if you aren't, then it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree hundred percent. That's at the end of the day. And so I try and give them uh, tools to use to comply. Uh, like we talked about earlier and uh, they're really grateful for that. Uh, they're also grateful that I dispel the myth that there's only one way. And I've had clients come to me and said that their doctor wouldn't help them unless they agreed to go keto. I think, you know, SIBO people when you do that, because if it doesn't work for them and they think that's the only way that works now, where are they left? Mm. You know, they give up at that point. Then I'd rather have those. One of the things I like about Mark Bell is he experiments with a lot of things. He'll do the keto. He'll do the one meal a day. He'll do the vertical diet. Carnivore, He's done yeah. a lot of things. Yeah. Carnivore, you know, and over time, he's discovered that different people, you know, different strokes for different folks, as long as uh, it's effective. I think what we do know is that we, in general, the obesity epidemic in general is a result of overeating. We just consume more calories than we used to. And that is driven by those highly palatable, easy to overconsume, low micronutrient dense foods. And again, I don't have an answer to, mm -hmm. to a cure for that for the vast majority of the population, only the people like you and me and our crowd that, uh, that's willing to, to do something different. Well, yeah, well, let's get the, it's the three ingredients, the sugar, the white flour and the seed oils, get rid of those, replace it with some more protein. And that's my solution. But uh, I'll give you one more because I always like to listen to podcasts of my guests before 
and you were on the show with some some British guys, and they were like, "How do I get my kids to eat vegetables?" And you're just like, uh, maybe you don't need to get them to eat vegetables. <laughs> no, that's a true story. I was at the airport, you know, and I kind of carry my sport around with me. And the guy in front of me had two young boys and they were probably, I don't know, six and eight years old. And uh, he turned around to me and he goes, see, boys, if you want to get big and strong, you got to eat your vegetables. And he mm. was he, he's like, right. And he looks at me and he's nodding his head. And I looked at him and I go, seriously, are you you're asking me for real? He goes, yeah. Mm. And I said, boys, if you want to get big, you need to eat a lot of red meat, whole eggs, and milk. And he looked at me in shock. And I said, I shrugged my shoulders. I said, you asked, man. I trained some of the greatest athletes in the world. I said, you're not going to get big on vegetables. <laughs> so he's, and that's what I believe, whole, you know, through and through. And I've done many videos on it. And I'm now writing a book, actually. My next book is Vertical Kids. And I talk about the importance of these these farm foods for, um, for these kids to achieve their genetic potential. And I'm uh, absolutely convinced that protein leads the way. And as a matter of fact, Dr. Jose Antonio from the International Society of Sports Nutrition did a presentation at the National Strength and Conditioning Association's conference in DC two years ago. And he talked about uh, uh, nutrient, uh, talked about diets for kids. And he, he said one thing, he said, get them a gram of protein per pound of body weight from a variety of sources. That was it. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that in its entirety. And I think that's where we fall short. I think that's where adults fall short too. Mostly mm -hmm. women, they get up in the morning and they'll have one egg. Well, that's six grams of protein. You know, in general, I think they should take in about 130 a day. How far are we now? They're only going to get in three meals, four at the most. How close are they to 130 grams of protein eating one egg for breakfast with a piece of toast and a cup or, of coffee? Yeah. Or oatmeal. They yeah, they'll think... Grams. Exactly. I well, the, or juice. It's like, oh, we got to drink juices, uh, or you know, like smoothies, or we got to get yeah. oatmeal yeah. with all the things. Like, this is no protein. These two have no protein in them. And, and what's that old commercial? Where's the beef? Yeah, <laughs> it, it's true. Where's the protein? If you really want to change your physique and improve your health and your metabolism and and have more energy, get a gram of protein per pound of body weight. That's the that's where I start with these folks. I generally don't even start with calories because I don't know yet what their metabolic conditions, whether they've been chronically dieting or whatever. I, I look at their diet and say, are you getting adequate protein? Is it from a variety of sources? Because I want you to feel better first and have enough energy and satiety so that you can maintain whatever program we implement. I love it. And, and you do have two kids yourself and you're not force feeding them vegetables. You're getting them animal protein and fruit. And I, you know, well, maybe you could tell us a little more before we go, but I mean, it, you don't need, yeah. you can get micronutrients from other sources. I it's just, this vegetable thing is this crazy world that we live in just because whole foods exist and cornucopia of a million colors exists. And we think that's yeah. how it has to be. And I'm not an anti-fruit and vegetable guy. I'm just, I don't lead with it. I, I lead with protein. I lead with the micronutrient dense proteins from a variety of sources, as we've discussed with my kids, it's the same thing. Kids always want desserts, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not the Gestapo over here. I'm not trying to uh, tell my kids they can't have desserts. That's the yeah. fun of being a kid. But I tell them that if they want desserts, they got to eat all their protein first. My kids, you know, know that they have to get in a certain amount of protein. Anytime they ask me for dessert, I'm like, have you gotten your protein in yet? And, and that's it. I show them what it is and how to make it and to make sure it's included in every meal. Uh, and then if they want a, a thing, ice cream or something, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not too worried about it. I, I'm not, uh, and I don't think most parents have the time or the, the wherewithal to, to manage that process uh, all that closely. And uh, I just think if they get the kids enough protein, the rest takes care of itself from a variety of sources. Well, specifically, just to make sure, just specifically with the fruits or vegetables, do you think that they need to eat vegetables or can they get nutrients from fruit or from other sources? I think they can get it from fruit and other sources. The biggest thing about vegetables is mostly the fiber. Uh, and that's individualistic as well. How much fiber, and this of course has a lot to do with the, the prebiotics for the gut biome, which is an entire you, you know, environment that we really don't know much about right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I did see a recent study that showed that moving your fiber from 21 grams a day to 45 grams a day did not increase the diversity or quantity of what's presumed to be good uh, mm -hmm. uh, microbiota. Uh, and again, I say presumed because a healthy microbiota is that of a healthy individual. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, and I, but I did see that probiotics, eating more yogurt, did increase uh, the gut biome. And 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 I'm not, you know, I don't think that probiotics are a fix all for mm -hmm. for anybody either. A lot of people like to eat crappy food and then take some uh, some probiotics and think that's going to fix that problem. And I'm not a believer in that. Uh, it hasn't panned out the way we'd hoped, but I'm just saying that particular study showed that probiotics uh, were more beneficial than fiber, increasing fiber uh, for that particular reason. Uh, but I have found that, that different people respond differently to quantities and types of fiber in terms of uh, bowel movements and, and uh, you know, mostly digestion. Uh, um, uh, I tell you, I'm kind of up in the air on it. Uh, I, I like there's a whole bunch of other things I think are more important. And like yeah. you said about getting in the protein, getting in the micronutrients, uh, uh, I'm, I would push fruit first. I'm a big believer in that. And then I would be cautious about how you respond to how much and what type and the preparation of the fibers that you do consume. Because I think that we're told that um, just recently uh, uh, somebody mentioned something about my diet specifically. And I, I talk about the fact that, that beans, you know, beans, beans, a magical fruit. The more you eat, the more you toot. Mm -hmm. I talk about beans being difficult for people with IBS. They can be hard to digest mm -hmm. and cause a lot of gas and bloating. And they mentioned that, uh, that uh, you know, that Stan doesn't, doesn't like beans. We know beans are good for you. And I'm like, mm -hmm. do we? For who? In, in what quantity? You know, good for everyone? Uh, a lot of this stuff comes from the Blue Zone research, which, as you know, I think you had a guest on talking about uh, the Blue Zones, or uh, a lot of those are uh, is fake news. Uh, it, it's just a horrible report. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it goes back to the healthy user bias. People tend to, that tend to eat more vegetables. Uh, it's the healthy user bias. They tend to drink less, smoke less, exercise more, and, and weigh less. Uh, and they'll make those choices as you know part of their healthy user bias. But if you take a group of meat-based whole food shoppers, this is a study that's been done, versus a group of vegetable-based whole food shoppers, uh, by whole food shoppers, you mean generally healthy individuals who don't smoke, uh, drink less, weigh less, exercise more. They have equivalent outcomes, health outcomes, and, and longevity, uh, all-cause mortality. And so it's really, a again, a matter of personal preference, but uh, it, a lot of it gets caught up in the demonization of red meat uh, by, um, you know, vegans and PETA and those folks out of Harvard. <laughs> so uh, I'm not inclined to say one way or the other is better or worse. I, I think they're equivocal in their personal preference, and I, I don't see anything that suggests otherwise. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to pursue the things that, that I enjoy that work for me. Uh, and, and recommend those to my clients who also like those things and, and, and tell them that the alternative is, is equally as good if that's what they choose. I have vegan clients. So. I love that summary and that study, like the UK shoppers, healthy shopper study or something. And yeah. I don't know if that's the one you're talking about or there's others, but it, I have this theory that for one, that people who eat fruits, like eating tons of vegetables is just a proxy for eating less processed food. It's kind yeah. of what you're saying. It's they have all the other healthy behaviors, but more specifically also it's if you're eating a ton of these fruits and vegetables, I won't even lump in fruits and vegetables. You're just not eating. That's a proxy for people who don't eat a lot of trash. And yeah. I have this theory that there's kind of only three main categories of foods of obviously this is not, I'm not saying this is a blanket statement, but it's like we have animal foods as like plus one we have processed foods as a negative one. And then there's a whole bunch of plant foods in the middle that are just a zero. And that people are proving this because they're not eating any plant foods and they're getting healthy and feeling great and all this type of stuff. I'm not saying to go 100% carnivore, but it's kind of turning this paradigm on, our head, on its head where we're, we think that these are magical. Like you said, beans, we all know they're healthy or we all know you know you have to eat all these vegetables. It's, it's so healthy. And I just don't think it's a case. I think it, it fiber, like you said, it's, it's, it could go either way. It's like, it's just there. And we find, we find that it's not necessary when people cut it out, they can still go to the bathroom. They can still have a healthy life. So it, it just seems like there's just this big set of just general like plant foods that are just there. You know, of course they have some nutrients and they have some benefits and you know, whatever, but they're not the pillar of health that we thought they were. They're just kind of there. The yeah. animal foods are the pillar of health and the processed foods are what's hurting us. It's just, it's so simple. 
in my oversimplified paradigm of the three categories. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And I'd say that, that, that I've often talked about uh, my personal preferences, my experiences, my very first video, I'm going to give you my advice from my experience. And this is, uh, and, I, and I've said where I have a bias. And I've said that, that things like vegetable oils, I've come out pretty hard against uh, seed oils because I've said, and I was very specific, I said they are a poison to me. They give me severe gastric distress. I can almost set a timer by it when I consume them. I was at Circus Circus last week with my kids and took them to the, the water park. And I got really hungry. They were there for like four hours, and, and I had not anticipated being there that long, and I thought we would go eat. So on the way out, there's, um, there was one of those uh, uh, restaurants that they have there, uh, a buffet. <laughs> mm -hmm. I never go to them. So uh, mm -hmm. we went into the buffet, and I thought, well, at least I'll have chicken and rice. I can get some chicken and rice. And we go in, and what they have is they, have, uh, they had uh, chicken thigh, and, you know, they soak those things in vegetable oil before they put them on the grill so they don't burn. Mm. So I took the skin off. I still ate the thigh meat. And then the rice wasn't white rice. It was a rice pilaf, and that's mm. just soaked with oil. I sat down and I ate chicken and rice. So I needed something. I was starving. Uh, and you could have set a timer 30 minutes after I finished eating that, and it wasn't a huge meal. Uh, I was running to the bathroom. And I get severe gastric distress. I did a whole video on, on, on this. If anybody wants more detail, it's TMI, but it's in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I've said it's a poison to me. And, you know, if somebody's got a peanut allergy, that's a poison to them. The same as with shellfish. It could be with a lactose allergy. And I'm cautious always to say that's different than an intolerance. Uh, that, that people can't eat foods that cause them gas and shouldn't eat foods that cause that they're allergic to or that they're very uncomfortable consuming in certain quantities. It's like the whole beans conversations. People say, well, you know, farting isn't bad for you. Yeah, but it's unpleasant, and it's certainly, you know, for your partner too. And if it's not something you want to endure, there's a lot of bloating and gas and, uh, and farting all the time, then you don't have to eat that food to be healthy. There's a lot of other foods other than beans that you can eat to be healthy that don't give you gas. And so it's really, again, a matter of personal preference. So I've always said that... Uh, you know, again, it's individualistic, uh, and you kind of hit the nail on the head there by saying that there's some foods that are that are generally, uh, you know, very healthy for people, and there's some foods that uh, I think we overconsume that can be very unhealthy, particularly if you gain weight. I think even Dr. Solomon Yusuf from the World Heart, Heart Federation, who did the Peer study, uh, looked at vegetables and kind of found them inconsequential. It wasn't good, wasn't bad. It was just. They were just there uh, amongst all the other things that they'd researched. That's quite a large study. Um, I, I think it comes down to the healthy user bias and personal preferences of how they make you feel. And I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to suggest that people not consume any prebiotics or any vegetables. Uh, the fiber can be a benefit to, to, to some people. I prefer to get that from fruits. There are plenty of low sugar fruits, like I mentioned, that are high satiety. I love to chop up some strawberries. I mean, a pound of strawberries is only like 120 calories. That's a mm. lot of strawberries. And I'll use it to, as a um, vehicle to consume yogurt because consuming Greek, plain Greek yogurt by itself isn't very tasty. And I, I don't like the, the sugar-filled flavored yogurts. And, but if you grab a big fork full of uh, Greek yogurt and stab a, a, a sliced strawberry with it, that's delicious. And you can consume a lot of that and get a ton of protein and a lot of micronutrients and some fiber and calcium uh, with very little total calorie caloric intake. And that to me is, is kind of the strategies that I use for myself and for my clients. I love that. I'll give one more quick tip to a more savory version. I have this ranch seasoning. Which ranch is just gross. It's just soybean oil and fake yeah. flavoring. But I have like an actual just pure seasoning of just a ranch flavor. And I put that on Greek yogurt or goat's milk yogurt, any type of yogurt. And it's like ranch. It's yeah. delicious. It's amazing. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. I was also using an orange juice yogurt shake, just a few ounces, just like three mm -hmm. ounces of OJ. Uh, again, I use that for my clients that are particularly interested in getting enough calories in a day. It helps uh, stimulate appetite. Um, and I'll have mixed like three ounces of OJ, uh, some ice water with a, you know two thirds cup of yogurt, and just mix that up and drink that a yogurt OJ shake. And it's mm. really delicious. And again, it's a vehicle that helps you consume more calcium and protein. Uh, you know, and it's tasty. So it's just a way for my clients to get in all the nutrients that they need every day. That's great. And and I just want to be clear, my seasonings it's at nose to tail. That's the one I'm talking about. 
uh, my company knows And last yeah, thing you know, I, I should okay. mention that some time ago I bought your um uh your jerky. What's it called? The Trovars or Biltong. Biltong, yeah, from Africa. It's from South Africa originally, yeah. South Africa, where they, they actually cure it without sugar. Yep. It's always one of my biggest complaints with jerky is it was always made with brown sugar. And that I don't digest that well. I used to eat the, uh, remember that oatmeal uh, with brown sugar as a kid, mm. the packages? Yeah, yeah, yeah for eat. sure. Even yeah. as a kid, that would give me diarrhea. I, just, I can't tolerate brown sugar in those oatmeals. But so I've always wanted to have a protein source to travel around with. Uh, but most jerkies are made with sugar mm -hmm. and yours is not. And so I was concerned it was going to be dry and it wasn't going to taste good. It was the most incredible jerky I've ever mm. eaten. It disappeared in like one afternoon because my family found it and uh -huh. it was soft. It was tender. It was delicious. I was shocked. It was amazing. Wow. Well, thanks for that endorsement. I'll send you some more. I'll, I'll send you some more. And um, I had, oh, I had one last thing. I just wanted to include this. I don't want to go on forever and I don't want to make this an ad for my company, but yeah, this yeah. has nothing to do with my company. You're talking about eating one Dorito. I saw this in your book. Oh, I'll plug your book. I got the vertical diet. Yeah. Um, great stuff. I love that. It's, it's like one of those super interactive books where there's like tips and photos and this and that. It's not just like, yeah. you know, and it said, this got me good. You eat one Dorito. <laughs> and then yeah. it was a strategy to be starving an hour and a half later. Yeah. A lot of the athletes that I work with, again, not to turn off the weight loss people and the soccer moms, mm -hmm. but a lot of the athletes I've worked with over the years and myself included many times when I was powerlifting have a hard time eating enough food. Great problem to have, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's a chore when you reach a certain size and you want to be bigger and stronger. Uh, it can be really, really hard to eat enough food. So I put a bunch of tips in here. We discussed some earlier about the ground beef, the bone broth in the meals, just to make them wet so you can consume more of it and digest it faster, the, the dextrose on the rice, uh, the three ounces of orange juice. Those are all tips that kind of help you uh, uh, to your metabolism. I, I have a video called Training Your Metabolism, and I think another video, 14 Tips to Improve Your Appetite, uh, specifically for large athletes who need to gain weight. A lot of these tips I introduced to Lane Johnson from the Philadelphia Eagles He's an offensive lineman there. Um, some people might be familiar with him. He's a Super Bowl champion, the all pro. Uh, when I started working with him, his dietitian, his registered dietitian, and not an indictment on dietitians, my co author is one, uh, but oftentimes they prescribe diets they've never actually tried, they've never mm. consumed, and they don't understand uh, what it's like to, to be 300 pounds and have to eat 6,000 calories a day to maintain it. That's a whole other world. It's very hard to do. Uh, but uh, they had giving him chicken breast and quinoa because they probably they put it in a, a chronometer and found out that it, it had all these nutrients in it <laughs> but you cannot eat five cups of quinoa a day i'm sorry but it, mm -hmm. you'll just be miserable uh and that much chicken breast is not very calorie dense and, and so i designed a diet for lane i flew out to his place and, and got him set up on some things uh he was struggling to maintain 312 300 you know eight 312 pounds He's up to 333 pounds now utilizing this diet. His blood pressure lowered. We brought it down as a result. And that was mainly from the implementation of a CPAP, a better hydration protocol uh, because he's a salty sweater and vitamin D he was deficient in. We did blood testing, the 10 minute walks, you know, a host of other things. But the diet in particular, uh, we used a lot of these, these low satiety methods to improve appetite. Um, and uh, that one Dorito is a, a, a strategy, a trick that I use on the body an hour after a meal or an hour and a half after a meal, you eat one Dorito and an hour later, you're gonna, you'll just be starving again and ready to eat your next meal. So that was a, that's a neat little uh, real life experience, like you said, that I put in the book that worked for me and worked for my clients that people have uh, hit me up now from all over the world. And so I tried that Dorito thing. Hofthor immediately uh, texted me and said, hey, I ate that bag of Doritos. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is like one Dorito to him, right? What, it's a it, yeah, plan. It's one yeah. Dorito for a guy that size. Yeah. Well, yeah. I love that. I, well, I mostly love it because it's just an indictment against Doritos and, and shows how low satiety yes foods work and why they work and yeah it's just it's umami yeah that's what and, it is it's umami that's that taste and it makes you hungry it makes you eat more
and just the, the processed carbs, just, you know, your blood sugar is going to go up. It's going to come back down. You're going to be hungry. The fake flavors, everything about it. It's just, yeah. it's, well, it just shows it's, it, it's an example of our entire food system in America these days, right? It's like, this is what people are constantly doing. They're constantly eating that one Dorito in all their meals, basically. And it's no wonder everyone's overweight and sick. Yeah, I kind of got off track earlier. I was talking about in the 70s when we released the food pyramid and talked, told people to reduce saturated fats. And that's not necessarily a terrible idea, although it's hard to find saturated fats in whole foods. What I forgot to mention to finish that comment was the net effect of that policy is what we're suffering from. When you tell people to reduce saturated fats and then the processed food industry dives right in with low fat foods, uh, or then low sugar foods, because this, you know, the, everybody's uh, opinion of, of what our obesity crisis is, you know, is driven by. Uh, that's the net effect. People were eating tons, of, just more calories in general, because those were highly processed, uh, ultra palatable, low nutrient dense foods. And that shouldn't be the case. Uh, I mean, it's okay if you want to minimize the amount of butter and bacon someone takes in so they're not, you know, sucking down 30, 40% saturated fat in a day if, if that affects their lipids. And again, that's individualistic, whether or not somebody has a problem clearing cholesterol and, and starts to get an elevated LDL. Uh, I do think those things are important. Those things are atherogenic. They, they are down on the list. I'll be honest, LDL elevation is probably number six or eight on the list of things that you could be concerned about in terms of cardiovascular disease. Uh, you know, behind a whole lot of other endothelial damaging factors, such as uh, I, I think uh, insulin resistance is number one, uh, just uh, type two diabetes and high blood sugars is probably number one. And then anything else that damages the endothelial layer. Uh, that having been said, it doesn't mean it's not a concern and it shouldn't be mitigated. And for those people who, you know, hyper respond to uh, saturated fats, uh, uh, LDL is something that I, I do monitor with my clients and I, I try not to uh, I try to make sure they don't have any other uh, damaging problems such as high blood sugar, high blood pressure, high iron, you know, things, high inflammation, uh, C-reactive protein, homocysteine, things that, that can cause endothelial damage, uh, which would then make them more likely for the, the LDL to, uh, mm -hmm. to accumulate in, in, in the blood vessels. So those are a lot of things that I do pay attention to. But again, the net effect of telling people to eat less saturated fat is they started eating more processed food and then started eating more calories as a result. Uh, there isn't a single whole food, as mentioned earlier, that I would replace with a vegetable. Uh, a top sirloin steak, or what, what would you take out of an egg to put vegetable oil in, which I think is tragic that uh, one of the reasons I can't eat, I mentioned this in the book, I think, uh, at most restaurants, if like breakfast places, Denny's or whatever else, IHOP, is because the five-gallon buckets of egg that's uh, is adulterated with uh, soybean oil. Mm. That did not add to its nutrient uh, profile. That did not increase its protein or biotin or choline or you know vitamin K two. None of that did that. All it did was make that cheaper. Uh, so those people could ladle a big scoop of egg slash soybean oil into uh, onto the grill and feed that to you. I'm allergic to it. So I, again, it's a poison to me. Uh, I can't consume it. I don't recommend others consume it because I think I'd rather eat the whole egg than an adulterated portion that has fewer, less protein and less micronutrients. Uh, the net effect of those recommendations has been that people eat more processed food. The vast majority of processed foods consumed or, or contain uh, seed oils. So I just don't think it's a place to uh, a recommendation that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, yeah, there's a whole article about why seed oils are bad that we kind of spoke about it. Tucker Goodrich finally uh, returned against uh, this guy, Alan Flanagan. I hear there's a debate that happens on Mark Bell's podcast. that's going to come out. I already soon. watched it. It did happen. Uh, they're, they're both uh, very uh, very intelligent. They're both very um, in tune with the literature. Uh, Alan argues that that uh, vegetable oils are good for you, but his argument, and, and again, I, I think you should listen to the podcast. It's I will. Very, very good. Excellent, excellent podcast. One of his big arguments is that in overfeeding studies, mm -hmm. uh, one of the studies in particular, the muffin study, 
um, where people ate 750 extra calories a day. And one of the muffins contained uh, seed oils. The other one contained uh, saturated fat from uh, palm oil, which again, other processed food. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody here is drinking palm oil. You know, mm -hmm. again, uh, what, what whole food would you replace with seed oils? This study is, is not an indication of that. This is overfeeding seed oils versus palm oil. Uh, the palm oil group uh, uh, got fatty liver at a faster rate mm. uh, in an overfeeding study. Uh, nobody here is suggesting overfeeding. Overfeeding just about anything. Fructose is not bad for you uh, if uh, consumed reasonably. The overfeeding studies on rats show that it, it causes fatty liver disease, but uh, anything less than 100 grams a day on humans mm. has never shown that. So again, the dose makes the poison. You've talked a lot about toxicity on your show. Uh, and that's another perfect example. The one thing, and, and Tucker has a, a, you know, a host of really great examples about uh, uh, what's it called? Parenteral uh, IV feeding. For, yeah, yeah, total parental nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. Using soybean oils caused uh, fatty liver disease mm -hmm. uh, and a host of other problems in children, especially. Uh, he had a lot of good points as well. I thought the best point was made, and I think I just said it by Alan Flanagan himself against the consumption of seed oil, Alan said the vast majority of seed oils are in highly processed foods, mm -hmm. which people shouldn't be eating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, that to me was, was the, the best argument. Uh, uh, you know, I'm cautious, uh, and I have been since day one, uh, to say that, that uh, it is a poison to me. It, I have a bias. I said both of those things in my videos. Uh, we discussed in our book, matter of fact, in the book on seed oils, we say they're mostly in the cause of obesity is overconsumption. Overconsumption is caused by uh, uh, highly palatable ultra processed foods. Seed oils are primarily in ultra processed, uh, highly palatable foods. So, uh, you know, again, you said that people like to, to, to put their finger on one thing. And I said this in my obesity rant, everybody wants to uh, play pin the tail on the donkey and, and you know, blame uh, find the one thing to blame for the obesity epidemic. And if I can recall, and it's been some years, I think I said that, um, that, uh, the enemy, everybody wants to identify an enemy, right? And you, we discussed this earlier where you said mm -hmm. people, they want to pick one thing Yeah. in the obesity epidemic. The enemy is also the victim. You're at war with yourself. The, problem is also the only solution and that's the individual and that's giving the people the education the information and the tools necessary and the support is key uh, to lose weight to change their nutrition lifestyle habits uh, to realize the health benefits of weight loss which as mentioned earlier 95% of all, all health benefits are realized simply from weight loss itself, irrespective of diet. So that's, we're kind of gone full circle now back to how do we help people mm -hmm. comply uh, with all the information that we've just discussed. It is, it's education, it's changing habits, it's changing your environment around you. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard with your, if your friends are going to all do the opposite of what you want to do. It's even yeah. the, the mental side. You talk about past trauma. I think you talk about, you know, it's a mental, it's a psychological thing. And some people have to do, yeah. you can have all the information in the world and all the best intentions of eating this right diet. But if you have, if you're going to eat when you're bored, if you eat when you're depressed, there, there's so much more to it. I don't want to start a whole nother podcast here at the end. <laughs> no, <laughs> Going but let me the... just say this then. Yeah. Let me give you the three tips. We talked about number one in a study on the behaviors, the, the, the weight control registry has studied over 10,000 successful dieters for, uh, I think better than, uh, who lost over 66 pounds and kept it off for greater than six years. 98% of them went on a diet. A plan is better than no plan. So any diet, doesn't matter. Uh, people say diets don't work. Well, 98% of successful dieters went on a diet. You need a plan. You need a pathway to success, okay? And we talked a lot about that today. 78% uh, of them ate breakfast. So whether you do or you don't, really doesn't matter of personal preference, but I'm just telling you that, mm -hmm. that intermittent fasting isn't the only solution because mm -hmm. the vast majority of successful dieters are actually eating breakfast, personal preference. Uh, uh, 
the, the study I talked about where I said that meal prepping was the single most successful intervention that uh, you could use, and it was actually uh, more successful than all others combined. Mm. There were two other things that they mentioned. Number two was tracking. Uh, that which gets measured gets improved. Weighing yourself daily actually does work. I know people talk about having a, um, an uncomfortable relationship with the scale and it can dictate their behavior for the day. But if you learn how to weigh, weigh yourself every day, but take the average of the week mm. and then look at that week over week. Those are the numbers that matter, not the daily numbers. Those will fluctuate wildly with water, uh, fiber, you know, food bulk, et cetera. Um, number three on that list was coaching. I think everybody should have a coach. I've utilized many coaches over the years. I fancy myself to be pretty knowledgeable, but uh, I've worked with just about every guru in the business from Mark Bell to Flex Wheeler to Eddie Cohn to Charles Glass to Dave Palumbo. I mean, the list goes on and on of people I've closely worked with over the years uh, that I've considered to be coaches of mine. So coaching. Let me tell you what that study showed was the least effective methods. Two interventions. One, doctors. Mm -hmm. Doctors were the least effective. Yeah. And two your nutrition professional, uh, you know, your registered dietitians. And the reason for that is simply they just don't spend enough time with you uh, or on an ongoing basis aren't a part of the process. So you need a coach or a partner, a husband or wife, a training partner, uh, somebody in addition to your meal prepping and your daily tracking. And I include in the book, of course, a daily tracking sheet that I still use to this day. I just put the days of the month across the top. I put a list along the left-hand side of things I should be doing every day. I write down how many hours I slept, what I weigh in the morning, how many 10 minute walks I took, mm. how many meals I ate. Usually I just take a picture of the meal. So I've got, you know, a history of the food that I'm eating. Uh, and then any um, supplementation, whether it's vitamin D or magnesium or things like that, uh, I just make a list and I check it off. And I can take a glance at that sheet and tell whether or not I'm in compliance or not in compliance. Mm. And my results will be directly determined off of my level of compliance. And so I encourage everybody to, uh, to meal prep, track on a daily basis, a host of different things that you can do very quickly uh, and get a coach or a training partner or a, you know, a, a, a husband or wife or significant other that's in support of your goals. Those are the big, the big rocks. This is awesome. So much information here. We love nutrient dense foods. And I think this was a information dense podcast. Uh, we covered a lot. It's been two hours. I love it. Wow. Uh, I really love all this stuff. Um, I'm so flattered that you've been listening to the show. Well, it's just great, great guests. I'll put it all in the guests. It's really all I do is sit here and listen and uh, let the guests talk hopefully enough. And man, where can we find you? Yeah, everything's at Stan Efforting. My uh, StanEfforting.com is my website and I have my vertical diet ebook on there. Uh, at Stan Efforting is my Instagram. Uh, Stan Efforting is my YouTube with all those videos that I discussed. Um, I've got a, a two hour seminar in Iceland where I talk about the whole vertical diet. Of course, the book just released. It's number one in new releases for three weeks running now on Amazon, which we're really excited about. A lot of people are, are getting the book. Damn. Yep. Help yourself to a copy. Uh, the Vertical Diet 3.0 ebook that I sell is a kind of a membership. It's a one time fee. It's a uh, it's a living document that I update periodically and provide to people. And anybody who buys it can send me DMs and ask questions. And so uh, that one's also a, a good thing to purchase if you like the, uh, the online version. And the meal prep company can be found at standefforting.com. It's theverticaldiet.com as well. Uh, we'll get you to my meal prep company. We deliver meals nationwide and have been for three years. It's been highly successful with uh, low FODMAP food. A lot of our meals are made with bone broth. Uh, easy to digest foods and we've really been very successful with that as well and that's everything i love it we did it uh i'll put all those links in the show notes and thanks so much and i'll uh hopefully see you in person sometime man that was great brian i really appreciate it all right thanks everyone thanks for sharing with a friend thanks for giving us a review on itunes or the podcast app go to nosetail.org for all the great meat you the other products seasonings body care really great stuff and great for our producers and the local ranchers we use win-win all around nosetail.org of course sapien.org for everything else you can link out to the film there the sapien tribe the program if you're ready to make a change in your life and the newsletter sign up there at sapien.org all right everyone we'll see you next week for another good one.